Peloton. We can see the damage at the back. Now the sprint opens up. And that's a terrific acceleration. And she'll take the lead in the race. Sprinting for victory. That is Chloe Hosking who celebrates. Hello and welcome to Geelong for the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. The fifth edition of the race with an honour roll that tells the story of a race that's difficult to predict. A solo winner, pure climber, Rachel Nalen in year one. Last year, the sprinter, Chloe Hosking. I'm Matthew Keenan, joined by three-time Green Jersey winner from the Tour de France, Robbie McEwen. Also with me is a woman who's been a world champion on the track and Australian road champion, Kate Bates. Kate, this course in and out of Geelong, it is a difficult one to try and work out who's going to win. Well, heading out of Geelong, the peloton didn't have a lot to challenge them as they headed out toward Barwon Heads Road, but 13th Beach Road and on the Great Ocean Road, and there's a few more things to contend with. The first sprint into Cor Torquay and then the Queen of the Mountains heading out of Bells Beach. They head back in towards Geelong, turn up Chalambra, which is always a divisive part of the course. And then it's expected to be a fast and furious finale into the finish line. One hundred and thirteen kilometres. The race got underway under ideal weather conditions. Twenty-two degrees at the start. The maximum forecast of twenty-six, and not a lot of wind to speak of. We won't call it gusts. Just a gentle breeze up to sixteen kilometres per hour. As they rolled out from the start, it was neutral. The flag came in from the race director Scott Sunderland. No major moves early. Down into Bowen Heads for the first of the intermediate sprints. And the defending champion in both the Mapai sprint classification and the race overall, Chloe Hosking, taking maximum points just ahead of Riccale Barbrietta, the Italian from B Pink. And then it was the Kiwi, Georgia Williams from the Mitchelton Scott team in third position. After that moment was Barbieta who just pressed the uh, issue a little to see whether she could force a breakaway on 13th Beach. It didn't quite happen then. She was recalled by the peloton, but it wasn't too long after that that we saw the Italian launch the breakaway of the day. She now finds herself off the front on her own as they're heading down towards Torquay and she's holding on to an advantage of just on 40 seconds as they're 3.8 kilometres away from the second intermediate sprints. There is Torquay off in the distance, one of the most popular holiday destinations for Melbournians. 23 degrees now, maximum forecast of 26. The weather conditions really are perfect for recreational cyclists, but not providing many opportunities for the flatland specialists with the wind at just on 11 kilometres per hour. Robbie, so far the race has gone as expected given the weather. Exactly, Matt. And without uh, big wind, you can't expect really big action. And it's the riders who really want to animate or get one of the early prizes, like the intermediate sprints. And that's exactly what Raquel Barbieri is doing. Second in the first intermediate sprint in Barwon Heads. And she saw she didn't have the speed to beat Chloe Hosking. What's the next best thing you can do? Go on the attack and win the next one solo. She's on track to do that at the moment, just three kilometres away now from the intermediate sprint in Torquay. And behind, no chase. Kate, she is all in for this intermediate sprint. The good news for her is the pink colours of her teammates are patrolling the front of the peloton. Well, the chase is just not on the field, is not at all interested at this point in shutting down that gap for the sprint points. But it isn't too far to the QOM after this. And I do expect to see quite a lot of action out of the bunch towards that. They're not going to waste any energy, though. Sarah Giganti, the Australian national champion, she's on the right. I'm Glad to see her up the front. She's a little bit bunch shy, but uh, heading into the QOM straight after the sprint, she'll want to stay up the front and look after herself. Well, you just saw that little acceleration. She was threatened to be a little bit boxed in, out of the saddle, re-accelerate. So the one way to get over being bunch shy or, or avoid it is stay on the front of it. Well, you waste a lot of energy being that anxious. When you are that nervous and you are that scared, you've got your elbows out and it's almost like you're just primed the whole time. It isn't ideal, but Sarah Gigante, well, certainly her talent has so far overcome that nervousness, but she will learn and grow into the peloton. Uh, Barbieri she... has taken that right-hand turn, but look at the gap. It's still quite significant, 33 seconds. 33 seconds the advantage for Barbieri, and she is riding this intermediate sprint as if it is an individual time trial. 
and she'll still be nervous with the gap at 32 seconds. She's two kilometres away, but we've seen how quickly the gap came down once attacks came out of the peloton. She is on to the beachfront, coming into Torquay. Barbiera with a 30 second advantage. She's just on 2.2 kilometres away from the intermediate sprint into Torquay. She was second at the first one in the Barwon Heads. Here is the approach to the intermediate sprint. Well, we can see the yellow arrow, and they take that left hand bend, which brings them just a couple of hundred metres away. The road falls flat downhill, so they get a nice run onto it, always wind direction dependent. But the speeds, they will be up approaching 60 kilometres now in an actual sprint. The men will see tomorrow, they will be hitting 70. So it's a very high speed sprint down the beachfront in Torquay. But at the moment, for the win, doesn't look like it'll be a sprint. It'll just be an all-out effort on a long-range attack from Barbieri. But just 22 seconds now, the gap. This slight little uphill rise, she'll be averaging speeds of upwards of 40-plus kilometres per hour, and she knows the peloton's breathing down her neck. The teams to look for, L.A. Cipollini, they have the defending champion, Chloe Hosking. Mitchelton Scott with a former winner, Amanda Spratt. She always starts as one of the big favourites. This is not a done deal. She can still be caught before the sprint. 19 seconds, she's still a, just over a kilometre away from it in Torquay. There's another little dip and kick up around the corner onto the beach front there in Torquay where the sprint line is drawn and I'm starting to feel that she's not going to make it. I don't want her to turn around anymore. I want her to just commit. She's come this far. She attacked over the top of the last intermediate sprint. She's been solo ever since. Look at her rocking and rolling and really putting the effort into this bike. She deserves this sprint victory. If that timer is right, 15 seconds and she will get this. She's inside the final kilometre. But certainly the bunch has started paying attention. They are sprinting for second and third place. And there's well, a proper lead close. out. There's a proper lead out coming. You saw the flags on the side of the road. She is riding into a headwind. You see now this is all out 100% effort because they have her in their sights. And she has been off the front on her own now for more than 15 kilometres. This is a hard way to earn three points. This is the little uphill. It goes around to the right, kicks back to the left. It's the Ale Cipollini team of Chloe Hosking. They are hunting down Barbieri. Chloe Hosking there in third position, number one. She comes over the top of the rise, goes around to the left and starts to dip down towards the line. But she's still 500 metres away. Once she gets past those flags on the left, it goes flat momentarily, then downhill. Now she's caught. What a brave effort from Barbariera, chasing just three points in the race for the MAPI sprint classification. And she will be swept up with 500 metres to go. It's an absolute heartbreak, but Barbieri will be absorbed into the chasing peloton. Ale Cipollini leading out Chloe Hosking. But look at that, Jessica Allen and Mitchelton Scott, they are hot on the heels. This sprint competition, they are not taking this for granted at all. They are really working hard into it. Romy Casper on the front, Chloe Hosking just waiting patiently, not wanting to waste any energy, but wanting to make sure of the maximum points. She still waits. They're hugging the barriers tight. Now she goes. Jessica Allen sticks with her. But Chloe Hosking, she makes it two from two. Well, Hosking, a clear winner of that intermediate sprint. We see from above the gap back to the next two riders, both from Mitchelton Scott. I was a little surprised that Georgia Williams didn't take the second place because she took third back in Barwon Heads, but no doubt about the winner. Well, I'm curious about the motivations of Chloe Hosking. It is really normal to see her sprint for that first intermediate sprint to test the legs and to get a bit of confidence. But her going so hard into the second one as well with a full lead out, it makes me question whether she backs herself to get over the climb this year because she's spending a lot of energy, both her and her team, are spending a lot of energy out there to take these sprint points. Or maybe she feels so good, she thinks she can double up and do it all again. There she's sitting in second position. She's just had a drink of water. She sits on the wheel of Jessica Allen. One of the key domestiques, the team supporters from the Mitchelton Scott squad. The blue shoes on the left with the yellow helmet, the former Australian road champion, Shannon Molsey. She's been ever present towards the front of the peloton. It's not too far before they head up toward the QOM now. So I imagine the teams will want to keep the pace high because they don't want to fall towards the back of the bunch before such an important moment in the race. The peloton making the left-hand turn onto the Great Ocean Road. 
Well, here's a replay of that sprint. They've mopped up Barbieri. The lead out coming from Ali Cipollini. Low speed and a short sprint. So Hosking gets out of the saddle. She accelerates hard, then takes a look, and she just free wheels across the line. Mitchelton Scott riders, Jessica Allen and Georgia Williams taking second and third. But that was very little effort for a good reward for Chloe Hosking. It was a smart sprint. It was a smart sprint. You only need to sprint, win a sprint by a millimetre to be the winner. So Chloe didn't use any more energy uh, than she needed to. But they do need to keep their eyes open because Barbieri attacked after that last sprint. And we can see a rider having that same sneaky move off the front. It's just in that moment where the peloton hesitates and takes a bit of a breather that can be a real danger. They're starting to head uphill now. It's the B pink colours once again, trying to get off the fronts. And this time through, it's Felicetti who is making a move to try and break away. This first section of the Great Ocean Road, as they've just gone past the RACV Club and the Torquay Golf Course, this shouldn't be underestimated. This is a tough stretch of road. Now, this is a, a very tough little stretch. It's only a short climb, about a kilometre long. But it's the longest one they've had so far in the race. It's the, the first proper uphill section. And when they get to the top of this, they'll turn left and head down towards Bells Beach. And they've got the great big roller coaster of a road. So really high speed downhill. And you think, I'm always going to have enough speed to roll up the next one. Well, it stops you almost at the bottom of it. And they're, they're really quite steep and a, and a heavy drag. But it's good to see Valsecchi backing up her teammate, Barbieri, from the B-Pink team. They've been on the attack now twice, making good moves. We'll see if this one pays off any better than the Barbieri move. <laughs> well, Valsecchi, oh. one of the more experienced riders on the team, and they've clearly gone out there with a plan to be aggressive. But it is dangerous, the riders just one at a time, because they don't have a lot of chance of survival when they have nobody to work with them. It's very difficult to stay out in those circumstances with the field behind at the moment not a, not a big response from the peloton they'll be looking ahead to the qom they'll be wanting to make sure their riders are in good position and with one rider off the front well it's kind of same same scenario we saw how quickly barbieri got mopped up by the field and uh you know if some riders don't jump across and and help well set she out she may end up in the same circumstance I, I tend to think this is more of an opportunistic move a bit like barbieri this is possibly to try and get the qom but i would think that the b pink team will be more looking at uh, teresa medvedova the slovakian national champion as a good chance to finish in the top 10 overall in this race the riders do have race radios so the women in their back pocket will have a little radio they'll have an earpiece in and they'll be able to get instruction from their team directors back in the car in some circumstances it will simply be reminders to eat and drink and make sure that the riders are staying calm but other times it's really used for the strategy of the race mitchelton scott their team director will be telling them just to stay calm and don't panic yet but b pink well their team director they'll be telling valsecki to go to commit to this to get into a good rhythm they'll be telling her what her gap is it's opened up to 26 seconds now and they'll be relaying that information just to help the riders out on course let's now get back down to our man on the motorbike at one antonio fletcher one hi matt here we are i mean just the road going up slightly uphill before the the mountains kom and um and before we go left onto bell speech obviously famous surfing spot and we have to say that the conditions has changed in the race particularly because it's a lot more shelter now the, the race is a lot more protected than it was and that affected as well on the way the riders we see that uh, they're tackling this part of the race they're a lot more relaxed now we could see a lot more of nervousism before because the wind despite not being that strong it was enough to bring the nervousness among them now it will be more about going uphill for them so they can relatively relax because the effort that we're going to have to put on the coming kilometers, it will be much higher. Robbie, when they do make the left-hand turn, they head down towards Bells Beach, as Juan Antonio just referred to. And this is where the race moves into its next phase. This is where the race for many teams in this peloton starts. You can see the course elevation map at the bottom of screen. Just little tiny bumps. It's a flat course until midway and you can see what is yet to come we talked about the big roller coaster of the road then the qom as they leave bells beach this is where the race is really going to start to take shape and the climbers and their teams will start to put some pressure on 
We also just have to make sure we keep a track of Juan Antonio Fletcher as they head down towards Bells Beach and make sure that he stays with the race and doesn't go for a surf because he loves his surfing. And when we see him in the media compound at races like the Tour de France, it looks like he's doing the moonwalk everywhere because he's just rolling through the compound on his skateboard. Well, a Spaniard who loved the cobbled classics in the north of Europe and a European who loves surfing. He's a special guy, Juan Antonio. And we love him. Yeah, they're just about to make the uh, left-hand turn down in towards Janjak and then on through to Bells Beach and the first of the uh, Queen of the Mountains. For just 19 seconds, the gap. So it was approaching 30 seconds and they put a neutral vehicle in between Valsecchi and the Peloton. And this is that roller coaster of a road. And if we get a long shot of this road you'll you'll see exactly what it does it really is quite a tough section well let's take a closer look at it as they go down through bells beach this is the climb the graphic very rarely does it justice but as you look at those red zones that tells the story that it does get very steep in a few of the pinches yeah so try and look at two things at once the arrow going along the road and it's beautiful to see it on a, a real map but you will see the red sections on the profile and red so often danger alert and in this case it means steep and it really does kick up towards the top and a steeper section at the bottom so that's one to put the sprinters in a little bit of bother and it's a long straight road as well as you can see from that graphic as this one is here as you're on this descent you can see the next climb in front of you and all you're thinking is momentum. I want to get as many free metres as possible. Well, there's not a lot of momentum on these roads because as they head further out, they're actually quite dead roads. And you think that you get to the bottom and you might be able to roll up, but it's actually not the reality of it. This really hurts the legs of the sprinters. It's the on and off and on and off. And it's kind of demoralising to see that big hill and that big road straight out in front of you. And the one they're about to hit is the longest one of all of them uh, along this stretch of road. You saw it rising up to the the top of the ridge there riders at the back you'll often see them just back off a bit give a few lengths they'll carry that momentum back into the slipstream and then for as far as possible get a free ride up the next piece of uphill rather than sit tight in the wheel and have to break when they hit the bottom of the hill well here's our sole leader Silvia Valsecchi she's a former dual Italian national time trial champion she's finished second in the road race at their national championships She'll have to put that ability against the clock to good use here, holding on to just a 17-second advantage. I don't like her chances of surviving to the top of the Queen of the Mountains. Price. Well, it's certainly a hard ask for a solo rider. A lot of the sprinters, well, this part of the race is a little bit intimidating, and you'd naturally think that they just sit at the back of the bunch and hold on. But often, Robbie, what's a good tactic is for the sprinters to start the climb at the beginning of the bunch ease the pressure off and make sure they just have a wheel to go over the top so in effect they're losing 10 or 20 seconds on those front riders but still maintaining their position in that main peloton at the back here none of our sprinters are here but a little bit uh, disappointingly we can see sarah gigante the national champion sitting right on the back there she's a climber but she's scared of the bunch this is not a good place for her to be and robbie the team that juan antonio spoke about just earlier ever observant the orange colours of CCC as we're heading down towards the coast in Bells Beach. They've found themselves at the front for the first time en masse. They're very well organised. They've always been easy to spot in the peloton, those bright orange jerseys, always all together. Other teams we've seen spread all over the peloton, but CCC always right next to each other because communication is often key when it comes to crosswinds, hilly sections, technical sections of the course. And what, ready a, for anything. what a great shot to show just how steep these rollers are. This really gives a very good perspective of what the riders are facing. The bunch, well, they're not doing too much work spread out across the road. When they're spread out across the road, you know that the pace isn't on too much. And the riders at the back are getting a bit of a free ride on the rollers, though. Not a lot of free riding going on when the roads are so steep. But Valsecchi, well, she's really going for this KOM. And I would say that the B-Pink team, they want to leave this race with a jersey. They've gone for the sprint jersey with Barbieri, and unfortunately, a lot of effort didn't pay off for her but Valsecchi well you know she's going for that QOM jersey now and the peloton is starting to respond only 11 seconds it's not actually a very big break when you consider uh, how much time can be made up on these climbs peloton they've made the left hand turn off what looked like cycling's answer to the big dipper as they drift around to the right here 
our race leader, Sylvia Valsecki. She'll be able to see it. There's a car park just on the left, and then it's down to the famous Bells Beach. I'm what fairly the... confident in saying that at this point in the race, the riders aren't able to appreciate the beautiful scenery that we are, uh, watching them out there. And this is where the wind comes into play a little bit too. On the coast, the riders can battle the winds. They're not too strong today, but when you're out there working on your own, every little bit of wind counts and you wish that the wind was absolutely at your tail and nowhere else. Well, we get the view down across Bells Beach and it looks like there's a little bit of a wave coming through Winky Pop. It's a place you want to be today. Beautiful part of the world, Bells Beach. It does catch the world's attention for the Rip Curl International that happens here each year, just around the Easter weekend. The peloton, though, as they drift by, as Kate mentioned before, they won't get the chance to enjoy it. And the ruse off on the right-hand side always make you nervous as a cyclist as they're a little skittish when they get near the road. Specially organised for Australia Day. What a shot. Perfect. If they can just stay uh, well and truly off the course, that'd be great. Looks like they won't get in the road of any cyclists, which is great. Valsecki, that would be a story to tell, wouldn't it? Well, they won't win the QOM. And Valsecki, she's hoping she can hold off the peloton, but just 19 seconds the gap, and the peloton will get a really big run down this hill. Momentum in the group will help to erase most of that time gap, and they can see the, KO, uh, the QOM rather rising in front of them. Well, interestingly enough, Valsecki didn't look to be labouring in the same way Barbieri was when she was doing her breakaway. The paragliders, they're right over Bells Beach. They're certainly enjoying uh, the view of the beautiful Great Ocean Road. What a day to be up there. Perfect conditions, clear blue skies, hardly a breath of wind. They've got control and the surf's up. Yeah, surfer getting a nice long ride down there below. So idyllic conditions here along the surf coast in Victoria. But the conditions for the riders are about to get a little more spicy as they're about to hit the foot of the QOM. As they go past the car park, they do dip down to the beginning of the first Queen of the Mountains climb in the race for the Subaru jersey. And clearly B Pink Kate, as you've mentioned, they're out to pick up a prize, but it doesn't look good at this point. 19 seconds, they can almost reach out and grab her. Well, and Valsecki doesn't look to be as committed as Barbieri was. She looks to be quite comfortable, admittedly, uh, but that 20 seconds will come back very quickly once the bunch start to chase and chase that QOM in earnest. This is a very nervous oh, point for the main contenders of the race because it's their first real test of any significance this first QOM and the likes of Matilda Reynolds, Sarah uh, Roy and Chloe Hosking, the sprinters, well, they'll be very nervous, I think, to see how their legs feeling as they go up this climb. As a sprinter, Robbie, three green jerseys at the Tour de France, been in the situation of one of the sprinters in this race, as mentioned by Kate, the likes of Sarah Roy. How would you feel about the way things have been going so far? You'd be feeling pretty good about them. You sitting in the peloton you haven't really had to make much of an effort until this point but we do see some riders just starting to struggle now number 132 Erin Keneally active early on good rider on the flats but starting to be found out as the road kicks up that tells the pace is on and there's some riders here who really want to get amongst the QAM but as a sprinter you'd be happy so far and you just have to hang in over the top here then you get some long flat sections again until we are on the outskirts of Geelong. Well, let's not play down just how much fatigue the riders can accumulate in the first 60 kilometres. It's easy to watch the pictures and make comments that they haven't been racing that hard, but the on-off acceleration, it really hurts your legs. Amanda Spratt from Mitchelton Scott just jumping toward the front of the bunch there. Valsecki, well, she's well and truly inside. The peloton will swoop her up fairly quickly as they climb up towards this QOM. Good to see Amanda Spratt looking after herself and in a good position. She won't be surprised by any attacks by sitting up there. But Chloe Hosking, we need to see those colours because she also needs to make sure she doesn't get into too much trouble. The white colours on the far right-hand side of the screen as we look at it. It appears as if Rachel Nayland, for the first time, is starting to show herself up towards the front. You can see where the leaders are. They've just gone past Bells Beach. They're approaching the start, really, the first of the Queen of the Mountains prizes. It's a difficult climb to measure because, as we saw the graphic before, it goes up early, flattens out, little descent in the middle before the last little pinch to the top of the climb. Uh, Valsecki has looked really comfortable on this climb, really controlled, not concerned that the peloton came racing up very quickly and erased most of that gap. 
And I wonder if she's almost played that sprinter tactic of sandbagging like Jay McCarthy talked about. Stay within yourself, ride tempo, lose some ground, but still have something left. And she's into that dip now. She's really not far away from the QIM. Well, Just 800 metres to the top. And the bunch will collect Valsecchi quite quickly here before they head on to the, into the QOM in earnest. 500 metres to go before the top. So it's actually quite a short climb because they're dipping down at the moment before they sweep back up. Well, Valsecchi, she's just cruising along at this point. She's waiting for the pounce to come from behind. Amanda Spratt is just riding up towards the front. There she is, number 11, not wasting too much energy. She's just doing 136 beats per minute. She is well within herself, Amanda Spratt. And the cadence at 90, 92, that shows that she's very comfortable as Valsecchi has now been caught. Well, now the race really starts in earnest for the QOM. The acceleration has come. They've map mopped up Valsecchi straight away on the very steepest part of the climb. It's a short run to the line. And one of the riders from the rally team is going away from them. That's and Dovell Hickok. She yep. was the rider that finished in fourth place in the recent Tour Down Under. She's one of the pure climbers in this race. She's a dark horse to win the race overall, but at the moment she leads the battle for the Subaru Queen of the Mountains classification. Well, Dovell Hickok has come here with big ambition. She is a climber, and these roads don't intimidate her at all. At the Tour Down Under, I asked her how she felt about Wollonga Hill, which is about 3K, and she laughed and said, that's not a hill and it was clear that I was a sprinter asking the question on that one. Uh, but a 500-metre climb won't bother her, nor will the 900 metres up Chalambra. She took that quite comfortably. She doesn't seem motivated to go on with it. And honestly, why would she be? Because she needs buddies if she wants to make the brake work. But when she accelerated, Taylor Wiles hot on her heels from Trek Sagafredo. But Dobel Highcock just with a good rhythm and climbing away from the other riders towards that QOM. An acceleration from the bunch, but nothing that could match Dobel Highcock. And the rider from Rally United Healthcare, well, she took it quite comfortably. Rodriguez from the Astana team in second position. Well, what I noticed on that KOM, really attentive at the front, Amanda Spratt and Maul Mampasio, not going for the intermediate uh, or the QOM points, but right at the front of the peloton, just keeping an eye on proceedings. Well, this is a danger point in the race because this is where the riders really do get their first test. And quite often with a more conservative start to a race, it can actually make your legs feel dead. Instead of getting to this point of feeling quite fresh, Sometimes you go to open up the tank and, and are surprised by how much fatigue you actually carry. Across the top of the first of the Queen of the Mountains prizes, inside the last 60 kilometres, the race is heading down towards Moriac. Back at the peloton with the uh, Cordamenta Real Estate Colours. This is Sarah Gigante, the current Australian National Road Champion, number 103. Off to the left, you saw Maddox from the Specialised Women's Racing Team, wearing number 145. And now, a bit of a reaction at the front of the peloton. After going over the top of the climb, more serious breakaways. Well, we're really in the business end of the race now. Sarah Gigante sitting at the back. She needs to move up if she's going to really be part of this bike race. Loretta Hansen, the Aussie for Trek Sagafredo at the front. She's certainly not a climber, but she's very, very important uh, in this race today for the leaders on that team. They've got a couple of very good options. The best would be Lotta Lepisto, the Finnish champion. Well, we're seeing a lot of the stronger riders, the ones we expected to see amongst the action when the race got hard, getting towards the front. Now I saw from CCC, Rihanna Marcus also getting up the front, covering that attack. So perfect time to go when the race starts to get hard. Everybody is approaching their limits, the time to make your attacks if you feel good enough. And this is where the race is really starting to get active now. As they're still riding along the surf coast but just inland from Anglesey and then they'll take a right hand turn on Forest Road long straight section so they will have a tailwind through there they are back onto the Great Ocean Road at this point they turned off it for a little while to venture alongside Bells Beach now that is the way to enjoy your Saturday afternoon just hanging in the breeze if you're not afraid of heights of course Peloton a momentary pause this is the stillest edition that we've ever seen of this race. There is hardly a breath of wind. And now the LA Cipollini team, the teammates of Chloe Hosking, moving towards the front to try and put a little bit of pressure on. 
Well, they've got a very good climber, Qualioto, Nadia Qualioto, uh, the young Italian, and she showed her form last week in Adelaide. And we haven't seen a lot of her yet, but she could really challenge up Chalumbra. And so Ale Cipollini certainly have more than one card to play. And again, the pink colours of the V-Pink squad, they've been the most aggressive throughout the race so far. They were marking that move, and now they're going again. They're out with a clear mission. Make the race tough, have an impact. They haven't collected any prizes as yet, but we've spoken about them the most. Well, they clearly want to make an impact and force a break, but they need to start taking other riders with them. And sometimes when you attack, it is pertinent to get a rider's attention to make sure you don't end up on your own because the chance of survival as a single rider out the front, well, it's just not very high. And tactically, B-Pink need to start thinking about how they can get a break to stick and one off is not going to do it. Well, this is Nicole Stairhing it from the B-Pink team and they are riding so aggressively. Now the third rider from that team we've seen on the attack, on a solo attack, trying to lure some other riders across. Their attacks have been very good, but they haven't managed to get anybody out there with them to make a real workable break. And uh, we've seen that it's nigh on impossible to hold off the peloton when they do want to bring you back. Stegger, she's just 20 years of age, the Dutch woman. So her first opportunity really at this level to show herself. And like the rest of that team, at the very least, they're not going to go home without a mention. But again, the peloton they recognise is just one rider off the front. No cause for panic. We can control that and make the decision at will as to what we want to do with them. Well, the peloton can feel like a ticking time bomb at this point when they're just rolling along because the field, well, they well know what is coming up and there are some certainly some difficult climbs. But while they're on this long and wide open road, there's not too much pressure for anybody to worry too much about positioning. It's just time to take a good drink because this is where the brakes will start to go. Well, as you say that, another rider trying to jump away from the front of the peloton. And it's along this stretch of road that they'll almost have to put the blinkers on and ignore the chocolate factory on their right hand side because that's where i like to stop him when i ride around this area but uh, jumping off the front number 63 this is Ryabchenko uh, from the dolcini van eyck team now also she's fairly aggressive well she's the ukrainian champion she had a very big breakaway uh, in adelaide last week the most significant of the tour down under in fact and uh, she showed herself not only to be very motivated, to be, but to be very strong. They're not letting her go anywhere, but certainly that turn of pace has pulled the peloton back together. I think we can look for more attacks now, and the riders need to be very diligent. The big teams, Mitchelton, Scott, Trek, Sager, Fredo, and Rally UHC, because Dobel Highcock has kind of put a hand up as a major contender after that performance in the QOM. They need to pay attention. They need to have a rider patrolling the front and make sure no breaks of significance go. The Mitchelton Scott team at the front. Sarah Roy it is who's controlling the pace, just nullifying this breakaway. We've seen the one rider off the front for the last couple of kilometres, thinking it, the young Dutch woman. There was the reaction. There's the chocolate factory, Robbie. Hold tight. Hard to speak when my mouth's watering. It's a good opportunity for the riders to drop back to the car and get refreshments. We can see the Swap It ladies in the Mitchelton Scott team, as well as Dolcini, just filling up on bottles before they head back in towards Geelong. This is kind of the perfect time. This is the Portuguese national champion, Daniela Rios, refueling. The Deakin University, Kill 11's Great Ocean Road race. It's through Bells Beach. It's back onto the Great Ocean Road. And the Portuguese national champion, Rios, just having a few problems collecting the bittens for her teammates. One gone. She recollects. And now she'll load up with enough to be able to provide a bid for each of her teammates. They'll be relieved about the weather conditions today, certainly by comparison to yesterday, where they had temperatures of 44 degrees. Today, 23, 24 degrees ideal for recreational cycling. Nice 
for a few of the riders in the peloton, but some would want a little bit more wind. So the bottles come out of the car and into the back pockets. Oh, well, and a bit of a drop to. there. <laughs> well, it is hard because these jerseys are quite tight because they're considering aerodynamics. So they're very tightly worn jerseys. So to wedge these bottles into the back pocket requires an incredible amount of coordination to ride no hands, to wedge it in the back there, and then to get going. They have a lot to concentrate on to do that. You don't want to drop a bottle in the middle of the bunch because if you hit a full bottle on a bike, well, that can be quite dangerous. So if she's going to drop it, it's probably a good time to do so. But it does mean that she'll be back at the car uh, collecting bottles for a little bit longer. The conditions aren't too hot, but sometimes, Robbie, this can be the danger area because they don't consider drinking like they would when it's 35 degrees. They think about it a lot more now. So they actually have to be more diligent in the, these temperate conditions to make sure they stay on top of their eating and their hydration. Well, with just 51 kilometres to go, they do need to make sure that the fuel tank is full. They've made the right-hand turn onto Forest Road. This long section, as the name suggests, through the forest there is not much else along here it's really a quite protected section they will be picking up a tailwind in this southerly so a rather easy part of the race and the riders do get ample opportunity to refuel go back and get bottles they are approaching the feed zone at 30 kilometers to go but we have seen in previous editions that's quite often where the race really lights up so better to be safe early fuel up get everything on board just in case the action is hot when you get to the next feed zone and you do actually end up missing it. Well, it's kind of poor etiquette to attack through a feed zone, but the feed zone here is on a climb close to the finish where it can be quite a dangerous time for the riders. So the, the riders know this. They've, they've been here in the past and they do know that this section be before they head up to Moriac is where they do need to take care. It's the least dangerous section of the course, if you will, for breakaways. And so this is where they can eat and drink and look after themselves. Have you ever had anybody attack to a feed zone, Robbie? Because I tell you what, you, you're not a popular rider when you do it. I've seen it happen many, many times. <laughs> See, seen it happen or do it yourself? No, I've seen it happen. This is our race leader, Nicholas Steiginger, the 20-year-old Dutch woman from the B Pink squad. This has certainly been the team that has been the most aggressive. She's the third rider from that squad to try her luck off the front. Just inside 50 kilometres remaining, making their way along Forest Road, heading towards the feed zone, which is in Moriac. And you can tell by the trees on the side of the road, often this is a portion of the course where they think, we'll get a bit of protection, we'll get a bit of relief. But the leaves on those trees are not moving at all. Reaction now coming from the peloton. It's quick along this section. Well, we've gone from quite a wide road of about, you know, three, two main lanes and quite wide shoulders to quite a narrow road. So that it's actually very important now for the riders to stay near the front of their bunch. A little bit of field out there for Anglesey. And if they had have skipped the right-hand turn onto Forest Road and continued straight along the Great Ocean Road, they would have ended up in Anglesey, which is fantastic spot for a summer holiday. Rebecca Wyasak going back for bottles now. That's what happens when they've got the bottle in the air. That's an indicator that their cars need to come up. What then happens is the commissaire will radio back to their team car and say rider number 104, Rebecca Wyasak looking for a feed. And so that's what the bottle in the air is indicative of. It's generally also considered etiquette when a lot of the teams are back at the bunch feeding but no attacks go. But well, as we can see, <laughs> that's not always respected. Out to 26 seconds now, the advantage, but the peloton is starting to change shape. You could just see them starting to accelerate. The riders at the back of the peloton out of the saddle, changing gears, accelerating, which tells us there's a move at the front. We've seen a couple of riders trying to go across to this solo breakaway rider. And if we take a look back, we see the physical gap, and there are riders trying to get away. Little splits opening up. And a group of about nine or ten riders now moving off the front, but all the major teams represented, just making sure they slip a rider into the move. And we see them put one there and not contribute, but just sit there, bring everything back together, knowing that their team leaders are sitting in the peloton and they will roll back up, they'll have everything back under control. For a breakaway to survive, everybody does need to work together. The attack's coming thick and fast now, but the peloton absolutely responding, and there isn't a single metre of gap opening up there, just the pace increasing. Quite narrow roads now, so this is 
better for the peloton safety wise to be strung out like this loretta hansen the aussie sitting in third wheel well she's really looking after trek sega fredo this is, the, this is the japanese national champion now at the front one of the teammates of chloe hosking what does that tell us about their strategy and the optimism of chloe to win the race well, Chloe is certainly shown to be on good form from her win in the first two sprints. Nadia Qualioto, she's also an excellent climber and another really good option for Ale Cipollini. So they're certainly on the ball. Heading along Forest Road, direction Moriak before eventually making it back into Geelong. The race is moving into its next phase. 11 seconds the advantage for the sole leader. Peloton just calms down a little bit after that action that we saw in the peloton an opportunity for our sole leader to start to extend her advantage at once again although you get the impression that she won't last out there too much longer and it would just take one more move from that main field to close it all down and the wind has picked up a little bit it's the quickest or the fastest we've seen it to 18.5 kilometers per hour well i think that's the thing on this course we've said early on in the race that there's not a lot of wind, but that can change and it can change quickly. And if the riders are caught out, well, honestly, it can only, it can be 100 metres when the wind picks up between success and absolute disaster. So the team directors back in the car, they'll also be radioing those, radioing those conditions up to the riders. And a tailwind is always good for morale. <laughs> it encourages, it's always good for everybody's morale. It encourages more people to attack. It makes for a much more aggressive race. Well, just 11 seconds now for Staghanger, the young Dutch woman, third rider of her team, to go off and have a go. She's looking over her shoulder and saying, well, when are you going to catch me? You nearly had me before. Now you've let me go again. It's a little bit frustrating when you're out there on your own and riders aren't able to get across and come and contribute and form a break. You just get pulled back in by those accelerations. Well, if convention's anything to go by, if she does get reeled back in, we can expect another B-Pink rider to jump off the front, but I think the field's probably wisened up to their tactics uh, by now. And we are inside that final 50 kilometres, uh, so the nerves and the anxiety, well, they've lifted just a little bit, as will have everybody's heart rates kind of the business end of the race. Well, within the peloton, now that we've seen a few of those attacks, the conversations start to happen about, OK, now we need to be attentive. We can't re rest at the back. And you can see at the front, they're a lot tighterly, more tightly packed together. If you look to the left of the road, you can see that the sand's kind of encroaching in onto uh, the edges of the road there. That can be really dangerous for the riders. That's where a little moment's hesitation, and if you're not paying enough attention, a little bit of fatigue, a bottle, a stray bottle, that's where you can really get into trouble and falls can happen. The blue and white colours of the Trek Sego Frito team right in the front. Sarah Gigante rolls through. She's riding really well, the 18-year-old, who's the current Australian national road champion. And the light blue colours, or the turquoise colours of Astana, familiar squad that we see in the men's road races. Good to see that they've got a women's team now as well. It's a relatively new team, but they're gelling together really well. It is brilliant to see a lot of the teams that are just same-same. No longer does it have to be women's and men's teams but now it's just cycling and so a lot of these teams are represented uh, equally across the board number 13 the kiwi georgia williams she really is cruising probably 134 135 beats per minute she's in second gear oh she's in uh well easy training ride mode at the moment but of course that speaks volumes of her powers of recovery now she's riding along at 30 kilometers an hour in the bunch and you know now and again freewheeling just 132 beats a minute and uh, always staying around that 92 RPM when she is pedalling, but she gets the chance to just ease it off and roll. But it looks easy now, but the race has been spiked here and there, like on the QOM. And I've got some figures sent through to me just before the, uh, the Velon data that we're getting. And the figures I got from Ashley Mulman Pasio on the last part of the KOM, average power 470 watts, max power 630 watts on that 7% section. Peloton cruising along Forest Road, heading towards the feed zone in Moriac with one litre at 31 seconds. Thirty-five seconds, the advantage for the sole leader. The peloton, they're in pause mode at the moment. There's been a few little attacks, 
And once they get through Forest Road and it opens up again, particularly through Moriac and after the feed zone, that's when I expect we'll see the next serious attacks. The calm before the storm. At this point, the riders are within that final 50 kilometres and they know that any energy they expend from here on in is very valuable. They need to be very selective about the energy they do. When these small attacks are going, and we have seen a few go and then come back, that stop start, well, that can really hurt the legs. We saw one of the Team Tipco riders pull over to the left there, possibly a mechanical. And an attack goes from swap at the Mexican team. It's the first time they've been out here in Australia, and that's Andrea Ramirez. And she looks to be committing to this break. Oh, but we don't want to see them go solo, Robbie, because they just don't have a lot of chance of survival. If well, I she... tell you what, the Tipco rider who just pulled over, they don't want to see a reaction like this coming because that is a really poor time to be on the side of the road doing whatever you're doing back there. But a very quick response from Arle Cipollini, the team of last year's winner, Chloe Hosking. They've got another rider, Nadia Qualioto, who's an excellent climber and who would do very well up Chilambra Crescent. They are very attentive and it's the Aussie rider, the national champion, Sarah Gigante, sitting tightly in third wheel there, not letting anything go at this point in the race. Riding brilliantly, Sarah Gigante. She's playing a role as an opportunist in some respects, but also supporting Rachel Nalen. Rachel Nalen is the team leader for Cordamenta Real Estate. She won this race in 2015. And for the first time, Rachel Nalen has started to show herself up towards the front. And Gigante is making sure that her team is represented so they don't have to do any chasing to protect Rachel Nalen. Well, the young Aussie champion, Sarah Gigante, she was the one right in the middle of the picture, just throwing that drink bottle away, getting a fresh one. And never mind, people, those bottles do get collected. A vehicle actually goes round and does a sweep so when there's no spectators or fans around to go and grab a souvenir there is a sweep vehicle that picks them up gigante's been given a definite job to do riding at the front go with any brakes make sure you keep things together for rachel nayland who's just on the right of screen she's there we go number 101 right from above in the blue helmet and rider number 104 rebecca wysak she's the bottle collector and she's the one delivering it uh, to all of her riders the number 106, just behind and next to Nalen, is Emily Roper, the lady we spoke about a little bit earlier, a dark horse for this race. Rode a very good national championships. I thought she did a little bit too much work too early, but that definitely earned her a spot in this team for the Cadell Evans Road Race. But it just goes to show that we really are entering the important part of the race because there are some big names gathering at the front here. One, two, one. That's Loretta Hanson, the Aussie riding for Trek, Sega Fredo. And Taylor Wiles, their team workhorse, by her side, the quarter meant the Aussie national team. Well, they're all grouping toward the front because that's the safest place to be. We want to see Sarah Gigante sitting up there. Loretta Hansen, well, she's not doing too much work. 133, that's a pretty cruisy heart rate for her. Good, nice, fluid cadence. She's just getting ready for those climbs and getting ready to be in a position for her teammates. And you can see the head just twisted to the side, having the chat with Taylor Wiles, number 125. They're two of the key workhorses for Trek Segafredo. A team with a couple of genuine contenders, in fact, three genuine contenders to win the race. Lepisto, the Finnish national champion. Longo Borghini, the brilliant Italian climber. And Winder, Ruth Winder, the American, who was second here two years ago. And Lepisto in the Finnish national champions jersey, seven times national champion for Finland, just shaking the hands about. You can tell her distinctive jersey as Finnish national champion because it's white with the blue cross on it. The national champions jerseys are very different to the individual team jerseys. The Australian one, well, it's got green and gold stripes. The Australian national team here, it's a similar jersey, but Gigante, well, you can tell her because she's got both sleeves with green and gold stripes. It's quite an honour, Robbie, to race in your national champion's jersey. It's fantastic to wear that jersey, carry it all season long, and there she is, number 103 on the left, as we look down right on top of Lotta Lepisto, the Finnish champion, as we just spoke about. Minus 20 when she left Finland, 44 degrees in Geelong yesterday, a 64 degree turnaround, and she's one of the favourites. And she'll be enjoying the freedom of wearing just a jersey in Knicks as opposed to undershirt, jersey, another jersey, a long sleever, another jacket over the top of that, leg warmers and all the rest of it. When it's minus 20, indoor training is really attractive. <laughs> This is our leader, number 94 from the B-Pink team, Nicole Stagginger, the Dutch woman. 
almost pulled back before they hit Forest Road. In fact, she was just about three seconds in front and then eased her way back out. But it's like they've got her on a leash. They're just sort of pulling back on it, letting her go again a little bit. And I'm sure she'll be wishing that a group would attack again and make its way across so they can really make a go of a breakaway. Just not happening at the moment. Well, the riders know that once the speed increases from the field, it's not decreasing again. They're too close to the finish now that every move will count, every little piece of energy. Chloe Hosking, the Aussie, the Commonwealth Games champion. Gee, that was an impressive win on the Gold Coast last year. And she's, well, she's just having a chat to her teammate. And uh, she won the first two sprints here. She's leading the sprint competition ahead of Georgia Williams and Jessica Allen and uh, Chloe Hosking. While well, the race is going her way so far, and she looks fairly relaxed. She'll be comfortable with the situation. She's shown that she's got good sprinting legs on, collecting the two intermediate sprints so far. But Chloe Hosking, no doubt, has bigger ambitions to win this race for the second year running. With our leader, this will just be a little bit of a psychological break. An opportunity to have a chat with somebody. A bit of encouragement as well. There's not much they can say that will make any difference. And that's neutral service courtesy of Shimano. But at least it breaks things up a little bit. Well, each team has a car in the caravan, which you can see directly behind the peloton. They have spare bikes, they have water and supplies for their riders. But when there is a rider off the front and the gap is less than a minute, they're serviced by neutral service who have wheels, they have bottles, and they're able to make sure that the riders don't get disadvantaged uh, by being in a breakaway off the front. We just saw neutral service helping out. Uh, getting a bottle up the front there. The peloton still not too motivated to ride and the gap, well, it's opening up almost near a minute, which will be the biggest uh, gap that we've had all day, but heading into nearly 40, just over 40 kilometres left to run. Trek Segafredo, they really are riding as one of the teams that's been in the peloton for 10 plus years they're so well organized this is their first season in the pro peloton as a women's squad well that will be all important as they get closer and closer to the finish they'll hit what, what is not a circuit around geelong they almost do a lap they don't pass through the finish line to do a full lap but they do take in the hardest parts of that circuit with chalambra crescent and it's about being organized getting your lead rider in position at the right time and depending on who they are and how they like the race ridden it's about using your team effectively and i think in amanda spratt's case that will be to light the race up make things as hard as possible to soften the opposition so she can make a big attack and try and go solo through to the finish and even if it's not solo she's pretty rapid as well well we've seen small breaks of all, um, survive to the finish here in a, in a small sprint a reduced sprint uh, we wouldn't call it a bunch sprint certainly but that certainly plays to the strengths more of Amanda Spratt than it would to of Rachel Nalen, uh, for example. But Sarah Gigante, if she's well placed over that climb, she's certainly one of the better climbers here who also has a bit of a turn of speed uh, come the finish line. Although having seen the way Gigante has ridden the race, the role that she's been given by her team to patrol the front of the peloton, I'd be very surprised to see her in amongst it in the finale she is a super talent and australian national champion but at 18 years of age she's got plenty to learn and this is a great learning experience but Robbie, for that's the what we saw at the um at the nationals there were probably 10 times where we said oh this is probably not the best for giganti she's so young or oh, with legs you know this young she's probably gone a bit early and she just kept bringing more she didn't win there by luck she won by class she did and this is an international field which is another step up Oh, I think she's doing a great job so far in any case. But uh, my money rather is on the more experienced and credentialed riders such as Amanda Spratt, Lepisto. One minute and ten seconds. Now the advantage for Nicola Stegger, the uh, Dutch one for the B Pink spot. This is the biggest lead that we've seen so far. And it tells the story about how calm the conditions are within the peloton. And number one, the defending champion, Chloe Hosking, is looking so relaxed down at the back of the peloton. 
Is it playing into her hands, or does this easy riding, in relative terms at this point, mean that it's going to be even quicker up the climbs and more explosive? Oh, look, every rider is different, every sprinter is different, but certainly the easier the run in, the nicer a ride it is for the sprinters. The realistic thing is that up Chalambra, you can climb that or you can't, and they're all going to carry a lot of fatigue in because they will hit that climb after they've already completed over 105 kilometres of racing. Heading towards the feed zone, five kilometres before they get there. For a sole leader, the feed zone is a chance to pick up one or two seconds, not a lot, as she won't need to really collect any newsette or feedback from that area. Meanwhile, back in the peloton, they will be doing so. As our sole leader, she get the chance to collect it from the team car or neutral service, as we've seen on a couple of occasions, courtesy of Shimano. Nicholas Danger now out to a one minute and 17 second advantage. Inside the last 40 kilometres, the stole leader from the B-Pink squad, the Dutch woman, Nicola Stanger, out to 1 minute and 18 seconds. We've said it a few times, the calm before the storm, but along Forest Road, this is really very settled. Number 15, that's Lucy Kennedy from the Mitchelton Scott team. She'll play an important role once we get to the outskirts of Geelong, because she's one of the world's best climbers, and she could set this race up for Mitchelton Scott. Robbie... We're going to put you on the line. Who wins? Amanda Spratt. No, it's not exactly going out on a limb, but after seeing the season she had last year, and, I mean, look at just how calm she is, physically calm, 106 beats a minute at 30 kilometres out. OK, she's just sitting in the peloton. The pace is not really on, but the fact that her heart rate is this low after already 75 kilometres of racing... I think she's poised to leave them behind on the climbs. She performed so well in La Flèche Wallon, Liège Bastogne Liège, and of course, that super hilly World Championships where she won the silver medal. For mine, hands down, she'll have to mess it up to lose it. 106 beats per minute. There are some people who get their heart rate higher than that, getting off the couch to make a cup of tea to watch the race. Yours is higher than that when you walk into the commentary box. Kate Bates, what about you? Who wins? I'm going to go for the Finnish champion in Lotta Lepisto, riding for Trek Segafredo. She's seven times national Finnish champion. She was third at the World Championships in 2016, second at La Course. She's certainly got the CV under her belt. She came to Australia very motivated for some results and some training at the Tour Down Under. Unfortunately, she was sick and wasn't able to compete, but she's taken that time to really hone her form, and she looks very comfortable. I mean, she's just sitting in the, in the pack, but she's been in the front half of the pack all day. That, to me, indicates that she's feeling pretty good and she's fairly comfortable. She rode really well in the Criterium a couple of nights ago at Albert Park. She showed that she's on form, and certainly, if she comes to the finish, even in a small group, well, she is the big danger rider. And Amanda Spratt needs to get rid of her because I would not like to enter that final kilometre with La Pista on my wheel. And she's got such a strong team around her. Trek Segafredo, we've spoken about them quite a bit. They've got a few options to play. And she's the one that sits tight and she waits. And if Chloe Hosking can win this race, as she did last year, La Pista certainly can win. I think the great thing about this field is there are a lot of riders on paper that can win this realistically. You could throw out, oh, maybe this one and maybe that one, but there are, it is such a high-quality field. It's the best quality women's field we've seen since this race started. So there are many potential winners as well. And at the moment, our leader out to a minute and 27 seconds. Not a race-winning break, but certainly a handy lead and will take some chasing down. Not far away from the, the feed zone now. So we've done our predictions. Matthew Keenan, who's your pick? Do I have to get off the fence, really? Yes. <laughs> yes. As, as much as you might be stuck in that barbed wire, off the fence, give us a selection. OK, well, I'm going to go with Trek Segafredo again, much like you, Kate, but not Lepisto. I'm going with the young American, Ruth Winder. She's 25 years of age. She was second here a couple of years ago. There she is, number 126. She's ridden well so far this season. The early form is good. She was solid on Thursday towards Zero Race Melbourne, protecting Lotto Lepisto. She can go with the climbers, and she's a quicker sprinter than most of the climbers. I think she's the woman to beat.
you think she's quicker than Amanda Spratt? Yes. Do you think that they can unload Lepisto? <laughs> yes. We're all, we're all backing our favourites here, aren't we? <laughs> I mean, I guess that's the point of not sitting on the fence, right? Now, yes, Trek Sager Fredo certainly have, you know, one of the most robust teams here because even their workers in the right break, they could certainly win. Loretta Hansen and Taylor Wiles, I would back them if they were in a small break to win. And it's what you really need. In a team of six, you don't have a lot of riders to offer up to do the work and you want to have an option A and an option B. And certainly Trek Segafredo have that with Winder and Lepisto. Mitchelton Scott have that with Amanda Spratt and with Sarah Roy if it comes back in a larger group. And Grace Brown. Do not underestimate Grace Brown. So you're starting to box the field, Matthew, and you're starting to go for others. You... No, I'm... That fence is looking comfortable. I'm sticking with Ruth Winder. <laughs> I've gone early. Well, Trek Unless Sager... Grace Brown wins, and then you're <laughs> going to say, I was on her. I... Yep, I picked her. Well, Trek Segafredo have not only a great team on the bike, but they've got Enioko Teutenberg, who is one of the most winningest cyclists uh, in women's road cycling history, sitting back in the car. And she is one of those kind of cool, calm and collected race directors who would just be telling her girls to chill out, to not panic yet, 35k left to race. This is the kind of course that really would have suited Ina because she was an incredible sprinter. But goodness me, she could certainly get over those sharp pinchy climbs like Chalambra. There is nobody better to guide a team and guide a group of riders than her. So they've sort of got an extra star um, on their sheet for that one. I think she might have won a World Cup here in Geelong. You know, remember 2004, 5 or 6, somewhere she, in that position. She did, but we didn't go up Chalambra. No, but, <laughs> but, no, there, but there were there some sharp pinches in it, certainly. The peloton all together. They're now letting our sole leader, Nicola Stanginger, out to a minute and 32 seconds. The 20-year-old Dutch woman, she hasn't got a lot of results to speak of as yet. She's only 20 years of age, but she's making a good impact on the race. I would have loved to have seen what would happen if she had one or two riders with her because that would have really made a very big impact. I fear that she's just being toyed with a little Robbie. They're just kind of leaving her out there to ride her hardest, and when they're ready, they'll just turn the crank and reel her back in. I think with 34 kilometres to go and those tough climbs coming on not only in Geelong but on the approach to Geelong, there's quite a significant hill that comes on the run into town in the finale that they'll eat into that gap very, very quickly, like we've seen happen with the other solo leaders in this race. When the peloton turns it on against a solo rider, well, that gap just melts away. The Trek Segafredo team in the blue and the white colours at the front controlling the race for the moment. They look fairly content. The orange colours of CCC, the team that one Antonio Fletcher drew our attention to earlier on, they spent a long time looking pretty relaxed early down the back. Since it's been getting closer towards the business end, we haven't seen too much of them on uh, camera three. They've been right near the front of the peloton. Well, although they're just rolling along, that heli shot gives you a better impression of actually how fast they are moving. In this tailwind section, it's up and down. It's on those, one of those little drags uphill at the moment. And it really is just getting set at the front of the peloton, waiting for the next attacks. And even though this section has been fairly straightforward, it's when those big accelerations come that you've really got to get the power down. Some of those Velon, uh, that Velon data we're getting. Loretta Hansen covering attacks. Along this section, she hit a max wattage of 890 watts covering one of the attacks. So it certainly is hard work when it is on. That is sprint territory just to try and close things down. But at the moment, we have a sole leader with an advantage of a minute and 38 seconds. They're heading towards the feed zone in Moriac, and then it'll be back towards Geelong where the climbs really start in earnest. Nicola Stanginger making her way through the feed zone. Kate, no need for her to collect from the feed zone. Because she's on her own with such an advantage, there's a team car or at least neutral service to be able to provide her with food or water bottles. This is a chance for her to nudge towards the 150 mark in terms of her lead. Well, she's certainly opening up what is a significant gap. It's very difficult for a rider to go solo, but she is absolutely making the most of it, and she's not hesitating at all. She's got a very nice and smooth rhythm. She's not looking too laboured. She's looked after uh, with the neutral service car in behind her. And Be Pink, they've clearly gone out there today on a mission, and that is to get in a breakaway. Maybe they don't back their chances over Chalumbra. Maybe they don't have a 
sprinter who will get over the climb because they certainly have in Valsecchi and Barbieri um, some very fast sprinters. But they've certainly really taken the attack to this race. And Beat Pink have animated from the, the get-go, the third rider now, uh, to really make a move. And without this, so I fear it would be a very quiet race. I know. Who will be pleased with the Beat Pink team? The race organisers. They have been the ones to shape the race. The peloton, they're approaching the feed zone, which is always a slightly nervous moment when you're in the big peloton going through the feed zone. Well, etiquette says that you don't attack through a feed zone, that you let everybody get their food. Uh, but the reality can be a little bit different when you are only 30 kilometres left to race. Feeding will be closed at the 20 kilometre mark, so the riders only have 12 odd kilometres left to get any bottles or any food that they may need. And then after that, well, they have to settle in for the final business end of the race. They make the right-hand turn here, but if you were to ride this road and you just duck around to the left, one of the old cafes that Kid 11s used to stop at throughout his training rides in the pre-season. Well, right about now, I think the uh, girls' water bottles will be full as they go through the feed zone there, full of Coke often, you know, or caffeinated beverages or something with a little bit of sugar to just give them a little bit of a lift because they're burning a lot of calories and using a lot of energy out there. 113 kilometres worth of racing today, 32 kilometres left to go. So this is the danger time in the race where you do start to run out of energy and go a little bit hunger flat. And the riders need to be very careful to make sure they take enough on board. The bright colours of the LA Cipollini team. Massing up towards the front. The last rider in line from that squad is the current leader of the Mapai sprint classification. That's Chloe Hosky. The rider in the white colours of the Quarter Mentha real estate team, the national squad, the black helmet on, that's Emily Roper. The Queenslander that performed really well throughout 2018 in the National Road Series. One of the riders we've spoken about quite a bit as a potential winner of the race today. Jessica Allen now in the black and yellow colours of Mitchelton Scott with the yellow shoes on. Plonks herself in front of the former winner of the race with the blue shoes, Amanda Spratt. Your pick, Robbie. She looks good so far. Yep, looking but good. I wonder how dignified she'll be after she finishes second to Ruth Winder, my prediction. Well, we do know that as well as She's being a class. phenomenal athlete, Amanda Spratt is a great sports person, so she'll take it all in a stride, but it's not going to happen. Well, this is terribly awkward. The peloton, they're just through the feed zone in Moriac. They're about to make the right-hand turn. Cadell's favourite cafe on many of his early season training rides, just off to the left-hand side. The Mitchelton Scott team, they're not worried about the solo breakaway. Jessica Allen is protecting Amanda Spratt at the front of the field. Well, Mitchelton Scott needs to pay a lot of attention here because it's not just about where they're sitting in the field and what's coming. It's because their riders are going to be getting nervous. Amanda Spratt, she's very experienced. But when you're coming down to the business end of a bike race, you know you can win. It's natural to feel a bit of anxiety and to want to be in control and to want to make sure your teammates are there for you, to calm you, to get you anything that you may need. And if she should have a mechanical or a misadventure of sorts that she will have someone to look after her well you just saw that last shot so our leader might be nearly two minutes up the road but they can see her clearly it's now a long straight stretch this is georgia williams now the kiwi who comes to the front having a drink for the mitchelton scott team big lucy kennedy she just puts her bidden back onto the bike this is starting to get a little more serious for mitchelton scott Mitchelton Scott is now doing what everybody expected, taking control of the race, taking their responsibility. They've got the former winner in Amanda Spratt, the out-and-out favourite. All the other teams are looking at them to do the work. We often see that is the scenario with whatever the biggest Australian team is. If the race is in Australia, they're the ones who are under pressure to do the work. And we see the same in countries around the world. Would this be a race in Belgium? Then the biggest Belgian-based team would be expected to do the work. It's just sometimes unreasonable but it's just the way it is. Well, and from that end, Mitchelton Scott step up year after year because every year in their existence, they have been looked to as the major Australian team to take responsibility of the race, and they're never shy to do it. Amanda Spratt has won so many races, even with a giant target on her back, and she's proven again and again that the pressure just doesn't get to her at all. I mean, what an incredible quality in an athlete. Spratt, she has declared quite openly that she struggled with the pressure early, particularly heading into the London Olympics. And it was one of the biggest disappointments of her career. But as you often say to your kids in junior sport, you win some and you learn some. 
And she said from those Olympics, she learned a lot. And that disappointment of not coping with the pressure has made her a much better athlete now. And we talk about the psychology of sports performance. And it is often the way that sports people sometimes think to themselves, what if I lose? Instead of thinking to themselves, what if I win? And number 16, who you can see, the tail end from Mitchelton Scott, that's Grace Brown. She is the second option for Mitchelton Scott today. Amanda Spratt, she will attack. Grace Brown will follow the others. Of the climbers from the Mitchelton Scott team, she's the next fastest when it comes to sprinting, and she's a big chance to win. And you saw her hit in Adelaide. She was very good at the Tour Down Under. Oh, look, I think Grace Brown is one of the most exciting young talents to come out of Australian cycling in a very long time. What makes me a bit nervous looking at her here is sitting right on the edge of the road like that because she's getting squeezed and a tiny bit of a duck off into the dirt, and you can often lose control of your bike. It can go south very, very quickly. It shows a little bit of inexperience from Grace Brown, and she needs to look after herself. We just saw a glimpse of Juan Antonio Fletcher on the back of the motorbike, checking the start list. OK, Juan Antonio. Kate has given her prediction. So too is Robbie. I've put my skin in the game with Ruth Winder to win. Who do you think wins the race today? I would go for someone with uh, some experience, like Rachel Nalen. I mean, I saw her going very easy at the Bell Speech QOM, especially look at the front. His pedal stroke was, looked very well, and, and now immediately after Porter's Road, she went back to the, she's riding nice and easy after the, the fit zone, and she's back at the front of the bunch. The reason why I'm saying that is because it's been very a nervous race at the beginning of the race with that wind, and despite now being a lot calm and, and the race being settled, I believe it's a race for someone with experience and someone that at the end will have, have safe energy, especially at the first part of the of the race. All right, well, one Antonio is picked Rachel Nalen. Matt, you've gone with Wind Up. Kate, you're on Lepisto. I've picked Spratt, and nobody has gone with Chloe Hoskin, the defending champion. We saw her in the picture there, just almost next to Rachel Nalen. So she's going to pop up and make us all look silly. Well, we're only given the opportunity to pick one rider in our defence, but there's a whole host of others who are contenders. Sarah Roy now, though, Kate, is starting to up the ante. This is Mitchelton Scott laying down the first stones of the foundation, potentially, for victory. It's hard to see, but they are going up quite an incline here, and the labouring that we're seeing from Sarah Roy really indicates how much power is going through those pedals. We can see that the field is being strung out one by two. That's an indicator of the increase speed this is where the the riders really need to pay attention about their place in the bunch and judging by the fact that the entire Mitchelton Scott team is up the front there there must be some crosswinds Robbie because this is how you ride into a crosswind Amanda Spratt well she's looking pretty comfortable and pretty safe amongst her teammate Chloe Hosking she was tucked in just right behind them well, certainly not enough wind to really make big splits in the peloton. You may see some of the weaker riders at the back have done some of the work, done some of the attacking, start to be under pressure. But any little uphill, and this is quite a drag through this section, I think Mitchelton Scott just want to put the race under pressure, make everybody work as hard as possible, because that is good for Amanda Spratt. And for the a first time... A few moments time... ago, we saw a heart rate at 106. Well, that has spiked up quite a lot. 172 heart rate, 36k an hour uphill. Spratt also getting amongst it, doing a turn at the front. So this is a serious acceleration by the team, with the leader also getting involved. And for the first time, we're seeing her under a bit of pressure. You can see the look on her face has changed from that cool and calm into a little bit more labour. The breakaway is still at a minute 20 out, but I don't think this is where the bike race is. The bike race is back in that peloton with Mitchelton Scott accelerating and really taking responsibility. Single file that field. The speed is up. Nicholas Stenger from the B Pink team at one moment it was 140. All of a sudden it's down to 115. Mitchelton Scott taking control at the front of the race. The LA Cipollini team, you can see the Japanese national champion, 
Yonamina. She sits just at the tail end. She's trying to protect Chloe Hosking, the defending champion. Trek Segafredo have plenty of riders represented. Longo Borghini is up there amongst it. That this is a real battle for the edge of the road. It is, and the breeze is just coming in slightly from the right. It's, it's not strong enough that it's going to force echelons, but it is putting a lot of riders under pressure. Look at them all on the side of the road, single file. So they're not picking up the maximum amount of slipstream. So they are having to make quite a big effort to stick with the pace of Mitchelton Scott. So this is really good for Amanda Spratt. It's start, starting to soften up the legs of the other riders and open them up to an attack later on when it does get hilly. Kate, is this a sign that Amanda Spratt is perhaps concerned that the race has been too easy so far and this gives the sprinters a chance? Let's make it tough. Well, so far we haven't seen a lot of the sprinters. They haven't been put under any pressure at all. Chloe Hosking, a lot of the shots we've seen of her, she's been almost freewheeling and just taking a very easy ride into things. We know she's on form because she did win those two first intermediate sprints. But Mitchelton Scott, well, they're looking after each other and they're working very well as a team here. Only one rider stands on the podium, but it's what the team does out on course that makes the difference. And gaps are starting to open. Is that the wind? Is that the pressure? It's a combination of both, I think. But the entire Mitchelton Scott team, they're protected at the front. Chloe Hosking sitting nicely in just behind them. She is riding perfectly. Longo Borghini is the rider in the blue and white colours. Well, she has proven herself time and time again in the high mountains at races like the Giro Rosa, the Women's Tour of Italy, and she's riding smartly at the front. Well, gaps are starting to open up, and even Sarah Roy, as she pulled off the front after doing that big turn of pace, she nearly dropped the wheel, and it was only that Yonamini jumped into that gap that it was able to stay together. But look at those gaps opening up at the back, Robbie. It, the pressure is really on. Yeah, so we are seeing riders go out the back door. So not the big splits, it's, you know, cause it to be a very small bunch there's certainly riders going out the back of the peloton those who have worked early those who have been in breakaways or been amongst the sprints but there are a number of riders finding it difficult at the back of the bunch there goes another one so like we say the back door is open they're disappearing out of it but this is significant because a teammate of chloe hosking this is maria apollonio and that reduces her workforce there's now five in that main bunch chloe hosking well she may have to look after herself at the business end of the race mitchelton scott certainly pushing to Toward that finale, nearly into the final 25 kilometres, Sarah Roy on the left of screen, she's been doing a lot. Jessica Allen coming in to take a turn of pace, but they're not alone because Trek Segafredo is stepping up to do a bit of the work as well. Well, it's the best defence to get amongst the team that are working on the front. If there's any sort of crosswind, get in amongst it, and it's actually easier to do a turn rather than just try and sit on the edge of the road and pick up a tiny bit of slipstream. 26 kilometres remaining, and the race has moved into its next phase. Our sole leader is not too far away. She's just holding on to a 26-second advantage. Five point eight kilometres remaining, but just inside seventeen kilometres before they hit Chalambra for the next of the Subaru Queen of the Mountains sprint points. After that descent, there's another climb. It's not classified in the race for that Subaru jersey, but it is significant in shaping the outcome of the race. It's a very difficult little pinch, and it's actually the steepest hill on the course. We know Chalambra is steep, up to ten percent, twelve percent even at the very top. But when they dive down and across the river. They take a left-hand turn, and it peaks at about 18%. It is really a leg breaker. Well, the bunch started with 90 in it. It has been drastically reduced, largely thanks to the efforts of the final last few kilometres, thanks to Mitchelton Scott and the effort they've put in. 25-kilometre mark left to go. Steigener with a 15-second lead. She is starting to labour, and she is starting to tire out. She's got... Her efforts of the day, well, they're almost over. I think the bunch will reabsorb her fairly quickly. It's been an effort to be off the front like this, but probably less of an effort than a lot of these riders have had to make back in the peloton just to maintain their place and not get dropped. The race is really backed off now. You can see the peloton's bunched up quite significantly and the desperate moves on the right-hand side <laughs> of the road... A cyclocross. ...trying to get to the front because they know, sure, it's settled down for the moment, but it won't take too long for it to light up again. But the edge of the road is dangerous and the riders need to find a way to move up when it's safe to do so and not take too many risks. It's when they get really desperate that it can be real trouble when they're trying to go from the back to the front. 
sometimes it's really worth the effort and the extra energy to keep closer to the front and really maintain that position. And sometimes it's risk reward. It's worth the risk to ride up the side, risk puncturing, but get yourself to the front easily. And here's our sole leader, Nicola Stanginger, the 20 year old Dutch woman. At this point, Robbie, could she be advised that, okay, you will be caught, you won't make the Queen of the Mountains point. It's time to drink and eat and just settle towards the front of the peloton. It Easier did, said than done, of it course. It did look like she was just starting to ease off in anticipation of being caught. It's gone from nearly two minutes to 15 seconds in the space of about five or six kilometres. Just saw the white colours of Rebecca Wyzak. Kate, she was at the back. As soon as the peloton breathed in ever so slightly, she swooped around the outside to get into the box seat. Well, she's done a lot of work today, especially getting water bottles for her team. The team leader, of course, Rachel Nayland. She's won here before. The first year it was held in 2015 and been on the podium since. We know she's in good form. We know she's motivated to have a good result. And when she's got people like Rebecca Wiesack looking after her, well, she can be quite confident of the day. And that's why Beck's at the front, to make sure that any moves that may go can be neutralised and can be represented by that quarter meant the national team. There she is in the white colours, the dual world champion on the track. Her hopes of being part of the Australian track squad for the Tokyo Olympics were dashed just a couple of months ago. But she's shown fantastic attitude by saying, OK, you won't select me on the track. I'll see what I can do on the road and prove myself as the rider to choose for the individual time trial. Well, a lot of talent and certainly a lot of tenacity. She won the Australian Criterium Championship uh, two years in a row. She certainly has a big turn of speed. I mean, I wouldn't like to arrive at the finish of this race with her, but her actions in this race so far have proven she's not riding for herself. Sarah Roy moving around the outside, the Mitchelton Scott rider. And as soon as they make the right hand turn, that change in direction. Well, Sarah Roy certainly laboured, but she's putting everything she can into, liver into delivering Amanda Spratt and Grace Brown onto that final climb up Chalambra. That's with about 10, 9 kilometres left to run that they go over the top of there. Sarah Gigante on the left. But they're slowing down a little bit. They're recomposing a bit because they do change direction soon. Well, just having turned onto Barrable Road, it runs from west to east the way they're riding. We see where the leader is, and they've just made that right-hand turn, so they are heading back to the east. A southerly wind should be hitting them directly from the right-hand side, which gives the opportunity to put a little bit of pressure on at the front again, as we saw Mitchelton Scott do on that last sector of the race here when it opens up no protection from the trees is a chance to do it once again and this is jessica allen going to work now at the front well, mitchell and scott need to be a bit careful because if they use too much energy it looks like sarah roy her job is done for the day she's nowhere to be seen now but trick sega fredo well they've been fairly conservative they did have uh, one or two riders swapping turns earlier but not nearly uh, in the same capacity as mitchell and scott Bit of a paddle in the dam with the noodles for the bike. Mitchelton Scott still on the front with the former Junior World Time Trial Champion, Jessica Allen. Twenty-three kilometres remain in the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. This is Jessica Allen at the front for the Mitchelton Scott team, followed then by Georgia Williams. Lucy Kennedy is the next in line, protecting the former winner, Amanda Spratt. The blue and white colours are Trek Segafredo. They've got some cards to play. And Longo Borghini sitting in second position. She has not missed a beat in the crosswinds. No, well, very experienced. She's not going to get caught out in a situation like this. She's too clever for that, too seasoned as well. We see Mitchelton Scott doing a lot of the work at the front, but certainly the other teams don't just get a free ride sitting on. We saw what happened on that last section. Riders going out the back, missing out in the crosswinds, even though it was very, very slight. Now, the domestiques, they really earn their money at this point in the race. We're setting up for the big finale. You see the hills looming. Fast downhill coming up as they approach Geelong. But there's danger all the way in. We've seen the race split over this next five, six-kilometre section year after year. 
Well, the riders need to be very careful on those descents as well because they do run into the climbs and riders will be jostling for position. How you hit the bottom of Chilambra is often quite indicative of how you hit the top. Mitchelton Scott will be wanting to look after Amanda Spratt and Grace Brown quite well. Trek Sager Fredo, they are grouping toward the front. They've got a number of riders who can make a big impact out there today. In fact, my favourite, Lotto Lepista, Ruth Winder, they have a couple of different options. The rider in the wide colours from the Cordamenta Real Estate National Team, that is Ruby Roseman Gannon, protecting Rachel Nalen. The under 23 Criterium Champion of Australia, she is just quietly going about her business. She doesn't get as much attention as some of the others of her generation, but she's one we'll be talking about for a long time to come. We haven't seen Jamie Gunning from Specialised Women's Racing yet, but she was on fire at the Tour Down Under. We can expect to see her head pop up soon. She said before the race she wanted to follow Amanda Spratt up Chilumbra. Well, I said to her, everybody probably will be. That'll be the busiest uh, wheel in the bunch. Uh, but certainly Rachel Nalen would be another great wheel to follow up there. She has won here before. She's on great form, and that climb is really where she will make her move. Uh, tactically, it sounds logical, but you need tactics that your body is able to deliver on. And following Amanda Spratt sounds good on paper, really difficult to actually deliver. This is Loretta Hansen out the front doing the job for Trek Segafredo. She knows that she won't cope with the climbs, so she's sacrificing herself before that dip and then onto the quick succession of three really tough climbs. And Sarah Roy's made her way back to the front. She has done the lion's share of the work for Mitchelton Scott in these last 10 kilometres where the speed has really increased. CCC Live, they're starting to move toward the front. Ashley Mormampasio, she's an incredible climber, a former South African champion. And she came to Australia to work through her form and to train into it, and she certainly uh, has come here today with a mission. She abandoned the Tour Down Under. She got ill throughout that race, but her form looks pretty good at this point. She's very comfortable. Got a good team around her for these conditions. Well, they're now on that very fast downhill. It loops around to the left, back to the right, and it's quite a long drag of a climb. We've often seen this race split apart in the first really big attacks that just explode the bunch. If you're in this peloton without any teammates to help you get to the front, it can feel like a really lonely place. Well, and that's where you kind of have to make yourself a pseudo member of another team. So if you are out there and you don't have any teammates who really can look after you really at the pointy end of this race, you just attach onto a rider who you think can help you. And I think that's why so many people will be fighting for Amanda Spratt's wheel. Sarah Roy, look at the grimace on her face as she comes down the descent. She is working hard because the higher the speed keeps, the less chance there is of an attack. Mitchelton's got, they don't want an attack before that climb. They want to allow Amanda Spratt to do her thing and take the lead over Chalambra Crescent, but they are going to have to keep the speed high in order to make that happen. And Trek Sagafredo, the blue and white interspersed with the colours of the yellow and black of Mitchelton Scott, both taking responsibility, both proving that they have something they are chasing here today, and that is the victory. That's Jessica Allen with the yellow shoes. She's all in. She swings off. She is done. It's now Williams, followed then by Spratt. There are three climbs to come. And on the first of those climbs, it was where Amanda Spratt launched her bid. There's a mechanical problem for the defending champion, Chloe Hosking. Well, the chain is off and jammed for Chloe Hosking. This would have to be the end of her race. She can't repair it herself. She can't get the chain on. She'll have to wait for the team car to come. And that is frustration. The body language says it all, Robbie. I, I think it was almost a throw of hands in the air because it could not have been worse timing. No, well, changing it. Here's the change of the bike. She's going to get pushed back on, but to be able to rejoin, this will be near impossible. They're on that long climb up, and we've seen the actions of Mitchelton Scott. One rider left in front of Amanda Spratt. That tells me she is going to go here, make the race really hard. If Hosking can get back, it'll be amazing if she can, but it'll also, I think, be the first big nail in the coffin because there are still more climbs to come. Really hard task it's for her. It's just terrible timing it. because. To use all of this energy, if she does get back on Robbie, they're about to go up Chalumbra. I mean, there, there could not have been worse timing for poor Chloe because she's proven uh, by winning those first two sprints that she does have good legs today. I guess that's one of the things about bike racing. Anything can happen. You just never know. But a very badly timed uh, mechanical for Chloe Hosking, one of her teammates has waited to drag her back up. This is um, who's waited for her, so we're talking about her as being a good climber. Probably the only one left who can help Hosking at this point. As Mitchelton Scott, they drive it on as they go further onto this climb, the climb before the climbs. And 
this is a really hard moment in the race and this Chloe Hosking, well, I think that is going to be day done. This is now Grace Brown at the front. Next to come through number 15, that's Lucy Kennedy. And the team gave the impression that Grace Brown would be plan B. I think they were all in on plan A with Amanda Spratt. If Grace Brown was to be a serious plan B, she wouldn't be spending this much energy now, surely. Kennedy, though, does take over to protect Brown. And she is an outstanding climber, Lucy Kennedy. That's why a sack in third wheel behind the Mitchelton Scott riders. There's Amanda Spratt. Longo Borgini, the Trek Sega Fredo rider, sitting pretty comfortably in there, just tucked in behind Chloe Hosking, grabbing a water bottle from the car back in the field but it looks like there's been another mechanical further up and the caravan is stopped behind that that's a crash straightening the handlebars on the left hand side of the road oh, so there's is. been a crash further up it stopped a number of riders and the convoy maybe a chance for hosking to get back make contact with that convoy maybe be able to make a way back across in time for the climb of chilambra number 51 they've been caught out here as a net barrera Regardless of whether Hosking does make it back or not, she's on her way. The energy spend here surely costs her in the end. Oh, it's going to be very difficult for her to hit the back of the peloton and then head straight up Chilambra. She does, once she gets in the convoy, she can save a little bit of energy ducking between the cars. But there is quite a significant gap as those cars accelerate back up to the front, to the back of the field. Mitchelton Scott putting in all the effort. Grace Brown on the front. Lucy Kennedy tucked in behind Amanda Spratt. Longo Borgini and your pick, number 26, Matthew Kennan. You have to be happy with that, Ruth Winder. But Rachel Nayland, she's tucked in and looking comfortable too with Emily Roper sitting tightly on her wheel. CCC Liv, Ashley Mormon Passio, she doesn't even look to be breathing yet, Robbie. She's a great climber. All the favourites at the front. One, two, three, Longo Borgini. She sits on the wheel of Spratt. Number 15, this is Kennedy. It's Brown at the front who is sacrificing her chances, and she was an outside contender. 126 is Winder. 24, Mormon Passio. She's the South African who has a big chance, and you can see the power output. They are big numbers, and she does not look comfortable, but she is still there. Next in line, you can just see the white gloves poking in. That is Rachel Nalen, who won this race in 2015. But the difference 100 metre makes. 100 metres ago, both Mulman Passio and Nalen looked quite comfortable. As we panned back to them, we started to see the grimace. Chloe Hosking doesn't look like she's going to make contact at this point. She has gotten back to a car, but she's only hitting the back end of that bunch and that that's is a long way away car. that's her own team car who's hung back to give her some moral support maybe a little bit of slip streaming but not really allowed but look at the big gaps between cars the gaps in the field with riders now being dropped under the pressure of mitchelton scott and you can see that first red car that's one of the commissaires the umpires in cycling there was a second red car that was dropping back to where chloe hosking was to make sure that any chase is a clean chase yeah, and I don't think the chase is going to be enough because the pressure is so immense at the front of the field. Looking back at that convoy, the commissaire's car keeping an eye that everything is happening above board and riders being distanced, but they're nearly at the top of this climb now. They go across the plateau. The wind will hit them again from the right before they take that super fast descent into the streets of Geelong and then in front of them will loom Chalambra Crescent. Well, it may be all over for Chloe Hosking at the back, but Mitchelton Scott, well, they are still at the front and charging away. Lucy Kennedy leading the pace. Amanda Spratt tucked in behind her. Nobody is looking that comfortable anymore. The grimaces are on the face. You can see the laboured efforts as they come into this final kilometres toward that climb up Chalambra. Amanda Spratt, well, she comes in as the favourite, but 175 beats per minute. She is not doing it easy. 188 watts. Well, that just shows that the pedal she's backed off the pedals a bit going over the top of the climb but the heart rate hasn't dropped yet and with lucy kennedy really driving the way we don't expect it to everybody else on her wheel they're going to be hurting too the white colors for the quarter meant the real estate team the first in line is rachel nayland just behind her robbie the woman you've spoken about emily roper the queenslander kadinia park off in the distance the finish line right in the heart of geelong on the waterfronts the most decisive part of the race 
is just about upon us. And that's the beauty of this race, too. You never know which is going to be the most decisive section, where they are now. Look how open and exposed is across the top of the ridge, and a lot of riders been dropped off, so this peloton is now just a leading front group. A few riders trying to claw their way back, a group of 12 or 15 trying to close that gap down. But Mitchelton Scott, they have got this race by the scruff of the neck. Grace Brown, you can see the bandages that she's got on. That was an unfortunate training fall. She had a stage win at the recent tour down under, and her boyfriend wasn't too happy with the victory celebration. So he suggested they go out training and practice the victory celebration. Well, she crashed in the process. Plenty of spectators on the side of the road. Looks like they've got the cricket stumps out. As Happy just Australia been, Day. There's been a break in play. Brown at the front, followed by Kennedy, then Spratz. 15 and a half kilometres to go. The wind kicking up in this section to 20 kilometres an hour. Not super strong, but with that climb in their legs, the pace that's been on, just the slightest little bit of extra effort required is enough to break the peloton into smithereens. Riders just disappearing out the back of the groups. This is a group trying to get themselves back on terms with the front of the race. But what is notable, lots of orange colours of CCC, the teammates of Norman Passio in the second group. So she is a little isolated. She's got one two teammates there well and also led by taylor wiles she was uh chasing the head of that chase group uh track saga fredo they do need numbers if they are to challenge mitchelton scott but longo borgini and winder they're looking pretty comfortable um uh, lapisto we haven't seen her in that front group we expect her to be there uh, but she's certainly not in that front couple of riders and longo borgini well I'll tell you what she has a heck of a resume she has won world cups um, the Trofeo Al Albeda Binder, that is one of the races, one of the hardest one-day races on the women's calendar, and she's won that. It comes in the early spring. She's looking uh, for a bit of motivation heading into that, and she's looking pretty comfortable. The race is splitting to pieces. The peloton is heading for Geelong. What remains of the peloton? We started with 90. We've got barely 30 still in contention. As we see Geelong and the finish line in the distance, the peloton, or what's left of it, is about to hit that very fast descent. A chance to rest the legs, consolidate your position in this front group and start thinking about one of the hardest climbs on this course, Chalambra Crescent, the climb that featured in the World Championships in 2010. As Georgia Williams comes back to the front of this front group and last drinks, back to work, keep the gap open and try and set up Amanda Spratt for a big attack. They're on a descent, but there is no backing off the pedals. Georgia Williams has made her way back after losing a bit of distance on that last climb through the sheer effort she has been putting in for Mitchelton Scott. Rebecca Wyasak, what a ride from the sprinter to still be up there. But she has Rachel Nalen and Emily Roper to look after from that quarter the national team. And specialised women's racing. We knew they'd be in there somewhere, but here they come. Taryn Heather and Jamie Gunning, they are both great climbers and they're making their way to the front of the field. They've played it very smart because we have not seen them all day just at the business end and that is a small peloton we started with 90 there can't be more than 30 in there now less than 15 kilometers to go all the favorites are bunching toward the front going on the right hand side of the roundabout the orange colors of the ccc live the team of ashley moorman passio the brilliant south african climber Barely rating to mention so far today from the Tipco team. You can just see number 42 poking into the picture, Brody Chapman. Well, Matt, you've mentioned it's the lady I've been looking for. And unlike a lot of the riders in this group who rode the Tour Down Under, her last race was a tar and gravel race, which she won. She's in form. It was incredibly hilly and tough race. So she is such a fantastic climber we saw her win an incredible mountain stage in last year's herald sun tour holding off the chase of anamik van vluten so brody chapman number 42 another big chance 106 emily roper she's riding well rebecca wyzak is doing an outstanding job 
Well, the world champion in the individual pursuit, she's turned her focus to the road and what an outstanding job she's doing. She's got Rachel Nalen tucked in behind, Emily Roper tucked in just behind there. There isn't a better spot for these riders to be going onto this climb. Mitchelton Scott, they've dropped back a little bit. They've burned a few matches uh, heading into this climb and shed a few riders. But Georgia Williams bringing Amanda Spratt, the favourite for today, the winner, the winner here previously and certainly the woman on fire after her victory at Tour Down Under. She has just brought her to the front. Rebecca Wyasak looking after Rachel Nalen, but Eliza Longo Borgini, Ruth Winder from Trek Sega Fredo. They are up there. The race is on to the bottom of the climb. Robbie, it feels like a lead out for a sprint finish, but it's a lead out for a climb. Well, for some of these domestiques, the ones doing the job for their team, their finish line effectively is at the bottom of the climb because that's where the job is done and they'll unleash their leaders to go on the attack. They're about to make the left-hand turn, then alongside the Barren River, and then it is onto the climb, and that's when the race will change its composition once again. The quarter meant the real estate team doing an outstanding job. And, Kate, this is a team that is cobbled together for just a couple of races. Well, they're cobbled together, but they've had a lot of phone conferences and they've had a lot of really good bonding time and talked about what their goals are. They've made it very, very clear what they're here to achieve and every rider is playing their part. Georgia Williams leads for Mitchelton Scott. Rebecca Wyasak tucked in behind. She is working for Rachel Nalen and Emily Roper, but they've dropped back just a little bit. Amanda Spratt sitting in third wheel and looking pretty comfortable. Just inside, 11 kilometres remaining in the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. What started as a peloton of 90 is reduced to less than 30. They're approaching Chalambra Crescents, maximum grading of 22%. The climbers here are desperate to get rid of any of the sprinters that remain. One who isn't in contention because of a mechanical problem, unfortunately, is last year's winner, Chloe Hosking. And I very much doubt we'll see her get back to the front of the peloton. What's left of it? This front group, the elite group left in contention in this race. In the background, a few more riders trying to scramble their way back across. Here is Chloe Hosking. She's on the same stretch of road. That's already a fantastic performance to get them within her sights. There's, well, not even the back of the convoy, because look at the splits. It's a long way up, and you see up in the top right corner where the peloton goes through this point here this roundabout they're about to turn on to the steepest parts of this climb this is Mulman Passio the South African followed then by Spratz Longo Borghini Jamie Gunning is amongst them so too Brody Chapman it's business time well, the field isn't stringing out how I imagined. Ashman, Ashley Mormon Passio is really, she's taking the scruff of the neck here. Longo Borgini just filling that gap for Amanda Spratt. But the field is actually quite big. There's a lot of riders where if they can even sniff the front of the bike race going over the top here, it is certainly not over. Amanda Spratt, she is looking quite laboured sitting there in third wheel. I've got to say, Passio, Mulma Passio is looking the most comfortable so far at the front. Amanda Spratt, we don't often see her in trouble. I'm not sure we'd say she's in trouble just yet, but Longo Borgini and Mulma Passio certainly looking in control. Small gap opening back up to Spratt, so she's certainly laboured, but the gaps are starting to open up. The three best climbers emerging at the front, and it's the South African, Mulman Passio, who's causing all the damage. She's doing the damage. Brody Chapman, she is coming back across that gap. She was with them initially, gapped off, and that's the nature of this climb. It goes very steep. It eases off slightly, and the end of it, where it goes up around to the left. Lucy Kennedy is coming across. She's the next in line for Mitchelton Scott. She's almost there. The black helmet just poking into the picture, Brody Chapman. Mormon Passio taking full responsibility, and they're just approaching the steep part. Well, Lucy Kennedy, we saw her doing all that work on the approach to the climb and that last descent, and now getting herself back towards the front of the race. She's an excellent climber, Chapman, and she will be a great ally for Amanda Spratt up at the front. Power in numbers, if they can have two in a group of six, they're in a very, very strong position. Only a couple of hundred metres left on this climb, 200 metres to go, still led by Mulman Passio, but she is turning around and easing off the pace a little bit. She looked over her shoulder there as if to assess the damage that she's causing. Longo Borgini, a small gap opening up, Amanda Spratt tucked in behind, and then a bit of a gap 
But the, the bunch, well, they're not too far away. Lucy Kennedy, the next on the road. She is causing damage. The gap is opening. It's not huge. Mormon Passio leading to the top of the climb. There'll be points in the race for the Subaru King of the Mounts classification, but that is not the ambition. Now Longo Borghini in the blue colours. She's under serious pressure, clawing her way to the top. The camera does do it justice. It's like a wall. Spratt is trying to bridge the gap. Kennedy is sticking with them, and Chapman has made contact. Brody Chapman not only made contact, she's going to come up and over the top. It's Chapman first across the top. She takes the QM. Mormon Passio, Spratt, Kennedy, Longo Borgini, and the gap back to the rest, and the field is absolutely splintered. Mitchelton, Scott, they've got the numbers here. They've got both Spratt and Kennedy in that front group, and they need to work together because... CCC live, they've only got Mormon Passio and they are on the hunt. Brody Chapman, she took those QOM points. What a brilliant last 100 metres of that climb for her, for her to claw that back. She does have a small gap. She's going with it. The riders behind, well, this is not the time to sit up and hesitate. Here's another look at the climb. She chased the whole way up in the black colours for the Tipco team. Brody Chapman just poaching the points at the top ahead of Mormon Passio. Well, what it tells us is she judged her effort to perfection. So letting yourself get gapped off a little bit, but coming back over the top and then pushing on across the top of the climb and onto the descent, it's Spratt who closes the gap. And look at the gaps forming between the rest. And Spratt making no mistakes, making sure she's quickly across to Chapman. One year ago in the Jayco Herald Sun Tour, it was Brody Chapman attacked over the top of the climb and the time trial world champion, Adam Van Bluten, wasn't able to close it down. Mitchelton Scott, once bitten, twice shy. Paying full respect to Chapman. Spratt looks back, see what the rest are doing. Also see where her teammate Lucy Kennedy is. She would like her to come to the front, I would think, to do some work again. She's offered herself up until this point to help split the peloton, drive it down to the foot of the climb to put Spratt in position. Lucy Kennedy, she will be an excellent ally now for Spratt. Well, they're in prime position, Mitchelton Scott, but they do need to do a bit more work than the other riders in order to keep this going. That is the responsibility of having the numbers game in the break. It's expected to see Amanda Spratt up there. She's doing a tremendous job, but Brody Chapman, she's certainly not backing off on the descent. And one of the Astana riders, Alena Sierra, the Cuban, has made it across into this group as well. Now, she's a handy sprinter. She, we saw her at Tour Down Under go top three in some sprint stages. In the first stage, she was third over the line. She is a handy sprinter, and I would not like to be dragging her to the finish. But she's not that well known, and I do wonder uh, if right now there's some team directors scrambling through the numbers and uh, hitting Wikipedia to figure out uh, what Sienna may have done. Well, the 26-year-old, she's sitting at the back. Most of her races have been won in Central and South America. She was good as well on Thursday in Towards Zero Race Melbourne, contesting the intermediate sprints there. She is a fast finisher. The rest of these are generally renowned climbers as Lucy Kennedy leads them across the bridge for the next climb. Well, the narrow bridge is going to bring them onto that next little climb we spoke about earlier. This first section just drags up steadily, gets steeper and steeper. Then they turn left, and it kicks up to around 20%. Kennedy is now back on the front, so increasing the pace, keeping the pressure on. They've opened the gap over Chilambra. This is the chasing group now across the bridge. And the Astana rider, she is really dangerous. She won a pancake flat stage last year in the Tour of California. Here are the chases. Rachel Naylor. At the front, it's Emily Roper. One, four, three, Jamie Gunning. This is a good group, but they've got some work to do to close it down. Here at the back, number 21, Cordovar from CCC. Back to the front group, Kennedy driving it on. Mormon Passio, Amanda Spratt now makes the attack. And Kennedy at the front, Mormon Passio, she's wise to that move by Spratt. Shoulder to shoulder as they make their way up the final climb. Well, she just matched the attack. Spratt went to go, and the anticipation of Mormon Passio, now they hit that really steep section. This is where it really hurts. Mormon Passio, she had the upper hand on Chalambra. Can she go again here? And look at the Cuban from the Astana team. Sierra. Sierra. This is Kennedy. 
Longo Borghini is laboring. Chapman is paying the price for the previous climb. Well, she's paying a price at the moment, but the intensity is so high on this climb. Maybe she's playing it smart, just gapping off a little bit and maybe able to ride back to them on the flat section. They're crest at the top of the climb, and it's now Kennedy. Perfect move of a teammate when you've got two. Go on the attack. Now Spratt can sit back and say, you girls chase. And she is a strong time trialist. She's been a medalist at the Australian Championships in the individual time trial. Presence taking, of mind, shortcut. Taking the shortest run home. Kennedy is in with a big chance. 6.2 kilometres to go, one climb to go as well. There's another steep little kick around the back of this circuit in the outskirts of Geelong. Kennedy with six kilometres to go is opening up the gap. What she has to her advantage is she's fully committed. Her speed will be consistent. And amongst the chasers is her teammate Amanda Spratt. And that will discourage the others. Nobody wants to drag Amanda Spratt to the finish. But Sierra, the Cuban, she's not dragging anybody. She comes across on her own. What a ride from Sierra. She's come from the background on Chalambra, got back to that front group. And not just going to sit and be used as a workhorse for Amanda Spratt. She's jumped the gap. And now, effectively in this situation, Spratt almost becomes a teammate of Sierra because she's not going to chase this gap down. Kennedy will not want to take Sierra to the finish line. No, and that may be the message that comes through now to Lucy Kennedy. Do not work with Sierra. Let her do the most of the work. And if you get the opportunity, attack over the top on the next hill. But we'd rather have Amanda Spratt come back and go on the attack. She's a triple Pan American champion. She's been a stage winner in a sprint finish at the Tour of California. Cat and Mouse starts. The Mitchelton Scott team, they doubt the ability of Kennedy to win that sprint in a two-up finish. So Sierra, she swung across and she looked for Kennedy to come through. She is on the front now, but look at the way she's pedaling. That's not a turn of pace on the front. That's actually slowing Sierra down. And the conversation, she's getting instructions at this point from the team car and she wants clarification. No, she is just riding there, waiting for Amanda Spratt. So the more she's on the front, the more she can slow Sierra down. Sierra now realises that, goes through to the front, and this is with full commitment now. Alina Sierra, the Cuban from Astana, and she's putting Kennedy under some real pressure. Phenomenal riding. Alina Sierra, she is committing. And rightly so. She fancies herself in a two-up sprint against Kennedy. So she should. Now Spratt, she has the opportunity to sit on the others doing the chasing. Chapman has rejoined the orange colours. That's Mormon Passio. And now in the second position is Longo Borghini. Well, the other three riders that Spratt is cut now covering at the back, they don't want to give her a free ride across, but they also must realise that the race is lost if they don't close this down. They're caught between a rock and a hard place. They've got to go. Number 11, Amanda Spratt, silver medalist from the World Championships one year ago. She has her teammate Lucy Kennedy out in front, but she's out in front with Alina Sierra, a Cuban who was a really fast sprinter. And we are seeing lots of conversation on race radio with Spratt and Kennedy back to their team car. The gap at 13 seconds, though, the front two, they're building their lead. And well, Sierra look, on her own. Sierra. Well, out of that corner, it looks like she just opened the gap back to Kennedy, who is now out of the wheel on the radio. This is a dire situation now for Mitchelton Scott. Sierra is away alone. She's tucked down. She went the aero position just briefly there. Looks back at the... How on earth did I get rid of Kennedy? She's got to go all in now. It's a time trial now for the Cuban. As Kennedy, she has to wait. She can't chase on her own. She's not going to get back across on her own. She has to wait for Spratt and work with that other group if they are to win the race. Well, there's Kennedy. She is out of the wheel. She's not getting back across to Sierra. And at this moment, she's not helping Amanda Spratt either. A decision must be made very quickly. Sit up and chase hard or try and get back. And the gap now is enormous. Alina Sierra is in the box seat to win this race solo. And she's the quickest of the sprinters amongst the leaders on the road. Phenomenal performance. Chapman at the front. Longo Borghini in second position. Mormon Passio in the orange. Spratt sitting at the rear. Well, Spratt sitting at the back, but she can now see that her teammate Kennedy is no longer at the front of the race with Sierra. And 
they have put themselves under enormous pressure and the others will now look at the Mitchelton Scott duo to do all the chasing Kennedy trying to come back the gap is too big she will not get back to the wheel of Sierra now Amanda Spratt attacks she has to go Longo Borghini responds then Mormon Passio Chapman digging deep into the well desperately trying to stay on the wheel Spratt with a look across the shoulder, seeing what sort of a gap she's created. But the race is out in front with Alina Sierra from the Astana squad. Well, the gap is there, and it's panic stations behind Spratt as now Mulman Passio takes over from Longa Borghini. But she is losing the wheel as well. Chapman is six, seven lengths off as well. And if Spratt can get to the wheel of Kennedy and get off at a quick turn of pace. She may be in with a chance, but I think it's too little too late. I think that Sierra has flown the coop. She's on the downhill from the bridge. She'll come to the roundabout, turn right, and it's all along the waterfront to the finish line. What an incredible move by the Cuban from the Astana team. Caught on over the top of Chalambra Crescent, rejoined the group, marked the move perfectly of Kennedy, and simply rode it out of the wheel through that right-hand corner. And she must have thought, how on earth did I get rid of Kennedy who was sitting on my wheel? Water bottles are gone for Sierra. She makes the right-hand turn onto the Esplanade. Kennedy and Spratt are chasing, but they're not together. It's one-on-one. -on -one. Spratt was on the radio. That will be to Kennedy to wait and try and work together. The chase, 18 seconds. That's back to Lucy Kennedy with just a kilometre and a half to go. And I think right here we are now looking at the winner of the Deakin University Women's Cadet 11 Road Race because... The Mitchell and Scott Rides are coming together, but the race is going away in the distance. 17 seconds. Kennedy is waiting, but she waited too long to wait. And now the two riders from Mitchelton Scott getting themselves together, racing for spots on the podium because Alina Sierra is putting in the ride of her life. Well, Sierra, just how incredibly powerful to survive on the climb, get across the gap, and then just mark the moves to perfection. And we'll have to ask Kennedy how on earth did that happen that she wasn't able to follow the wheel the Mitchell and Scott riders now together if they had five kilometers up their sleeve they may get the job done 1k to go with 18 seconds it's a done deal number 36 here this is Arlene Sierra the Cuban from Astana she is riding towards the win time trial position looking in full control and that she is it is her third season with the Astana squad She's won loads of races in Central America and South America. Now the rider from Cuba is on target for the biggest victory of her career. From winning sprint finishes at the Tour of California last year, she has ridden the best climbers in the world out of her wheel. Well, quite an incredible performance. 16 seconds the gap, so they're starting to narrow that down. But she's coming into sight of our fixed cameras now, well within the last kilometre on the right side. Finish 400 metres. She is just approaching that now. The road starts to dip away, and in the distance, the Mitchelton Scott pairing. Sierra is on the road to victory. They will see her cross the line eventually with her arms in the air. Sierra takes a little look across the shoulder, but she doesn't dare to ease up. The 26-year-old for the Astana team is on targets to win the fifth edition of the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race. The Colombian has smoked them. Convincing win for Sierra. The race is now on for the minor placings. The teammates from Mitchelton Scott, Kennedy and Spratt will debrief asking the question what went wrong but today sierra was simply too good this is kennedy leading them across the line sprats in third position today 19 seconds the gap a shake of the hands but quite possibly both of them in disbelief the sprint now for four longo borghini passio Mulman passio and borghini photo for four brody chapman and this is Rachel Nalen chasing in, almost there for the former winner. Another top 10 finish for her, Sierra being chased. Now the sprint for the minor placings, Grace Brown is in there amongst it, slipping through the middle, Ruth Winder Emily and Roper. Emily Roper in the white colours. Well, quite a group coming together for what was left of the top 10 positions, but absolutely no doubt about our winner Clearly the strongest and the smartest. Sierra, what an incredible ride. 
She takes the win ahead of Lucy Kennedy, then Amanda Spratt. It was Longo Borghini, then Maudlin Passio. Chapman was the next best. Nayland coming in on her own. It was Alison Jackson who led home the rest of the peloton. Huge win for the Cuban. Takes out a massive victory. And the team, they join in with the celebrations. Amanda Spratt showing her class pretty quickly over to congratulate her. And this looks like it might be Chloe Hosking leading home the next bunch for a sprint. It is Chloe Hosking. That is sprinting out the frustration. A terrible luck there for Chloe Hosking, a jam chain on the approach to Geelong in the final part of the race when there was so much pressure on from Mitchelton Scott. Last year's winner, and she comes in, I would say, outside the top 30 today. <laughs> but let's head down to Kate Bates with the race winner. Oh, Spratty, you guys did an absolutely outstanding job out there, Mitchelton Scott. Second and third, though, Sierra just snuck away at the finish. Yeah, actually, Sierra had a great race. Um, she also got World Tour podiums last year, so we know she's a great rider, and um, all credit to her. I think my team rode really amazing and set up Lucy and I there in the end to have a go. How much pressure did you feel coming in? Because from the very start of the race, Mitchelton and Scott were the people who everyone was looking at for the win. Yeah, I think we felt a fair amount of pressure. We could see that um, we had to take a lot of responsibility whether we wanted to or not. And, um, yeah, we took the race like we could in the last sort of 30K and tried to make it as hard as possible. And there are a lot of attacks out there today, especially from Be Pink. At any time, did you guys feel a little bit nervous about what was going on? Uh, we were monitoring it, put it that way. Um, you know, it's, it's a bit of an unpredictable course, so you do have to be careful. But um, I felt like we had it under control the whole time. <laughs> Well, an amazing teamwork. Lucy, you really stepped up today. Those final couple of kilometres, they sure challenged you all the way to the line. Oh, yeah, yeah. Those last 20, 25k were really, really hard. I was really looking forward to it, actually. My leg, I could tell from the beginning that I had good legs and, you know, the team rode so strongly there to set it up. And, um, yeah, the Astana girl was super strong and, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't quite get there. You guys came in as favourites. I know that puts a bit of pressure on you, but it must also give you some confidence. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there's pros and cons to being the team that everyone looks to. I'm uh, sure they're expecting us to make that, that final hard, and that's what we did. Uh, we just couldn't quite pull off the win. Well, we're used to seeing you guys on the top step today, second and third, but congratulations. Well ridden. Thanks. Well, Amanda Spratt and Lucy Kennedy, but it was the Cuban, Alina Sierra, who got the job done convincingly. Well, she just had that clear run all the way in through those final four or so kilometres and could practice the victory salute in her mind. Get it right for the finish line and make sure she gets a very nice photo to put on the wall from the Deakin University Cadell Evans Road Race. The Cuban, what an incredible ride. And clearly Lucy Kennedy wasn't too sure who she was as she just referred to as the Astana rider. She knows now. Well, there'll be no doubt about that. And a huge win for the Astana team and for Arlenis Sierra. Well, the sales event that is happening here as well at the same time, it's the oldest sporting event in Australia, in fact. It's one of the new ones now in its fifth edition, the Deakin University Cadell Evans Great Ocean Road Race has delivered yet again. It was fairly calm early, but the final 25 or 30 kilometres were action-packed. And it was absolutely going to the script. We knew that Mitchelton Scott would make things hard for Amanda Spratt, but if we see our top 10, Arlena Sierra, from Astana, the Cuban taking the top spot. Lucy Kennedy leading Amanda Spratt across the line for second and third. Mulman Passio gets the nod for fourth place. Longo Borgini, Brody Chapman in sixth. Rachel Nalen, a former winner in seventh. Emily Roper won the bunch sprint behind for the eighth place. Ruth Winder and Grace Brown. So Mitchelton Scott with three riders in the top ten. Further down the list, uh, we look to see Alison Jackson sprinted home fairly well. Rebecca Wyzak, that's a good performance by her. And Matilda Reynolds, solid ride for the rider from the Specialised team. Romy Casper from the LA Cipollini team also squeezing inside the top 20. On a course where she would have been hoping she'd be leading the sprint out for her defending champion teammate, Chloe Hosking. 
who had the mechanical problem at the back end of the race and it cost her any chance of being able to win for the second year running. Well, for a sprinter to win on this course, everything has to go absolutely right. You have to get a pretty smooth run into the climbs and just be able to hang in there. This is where it happened. And we said in the corner, it just seemed that Kennedy did not follow the wheel. So just a matter of cornering skills. Kennedy was out of the wheel. Sierra, she noticed straight away. And you feel it as a rider. When someone's just a length or two out of the wheel, you know you've got them. And she pressed on immediately. Time trial position, opened the gap up. That was the winning move. And that's exactly the same way Sarah Gigante launched the winning attack at the National Road Championships just a few weeks ago when she gapped Shara Gillo through a corner. You've got to be able to climb. You've also got to be able to corner. That cost Lucy Kennedy dearly, but we do know Sierra is also a very fast sprinter. I'm sure if it was a two-up sprint, we would have had the same result, but uh, quite the surprise to see it happen like it did. But Sierra, she took the bit between her teeth and she made every post a winner. I must confess, she wasn't one of the riders that I tipped as a potential winner. None of us did. Incidentally, for the Best Young Rider classification, the Jerry Ryan Best Young Rider classification, it was Korovar from the CCC Live team. And there's Amanda Spratt congratulating Sierra on her win. A little more excitement from her own teammate congratulating her on the win because I'm sure Amanda Spratt, as sporting as she is, she'll be shaking her head at how the finale went down when they had so much control over it. Almost a little bit of disbelief as they debrief on how it was all done. And I must admit, I haven't seen too many Colo uh, Cubans win races of this stature. No, well, she's a, a real discovery for us on the, the international circuit, on the world tour. And that is most certainly the biggest win of her career. And she joins a very distinguished honour roll here at the Cadell Evans Road Race. And the 26-year-old going out a convincing winner ahead of Lucy Kennedy and then Amanda Spratt. And the quality of the result sheet will add to the value of the victory for her with the likes of Longo Borghini and Mulman Passio also inside the top 10. It shows that it really was a world-class field that she managed to beat. And I'd suggest that 26 years of age, there's a lot still to come. Geelong at its very best. As we look down upon the finish line where the men We'll be getting underway tomorrow for a race of uh, just on 170 kilometres. For Alina Sierra and the Astana women's team, it is time for them to celebrate. Their trip down under has been a successful one. That it has, and... Although she's a, quite a new name to us, and this would be the biggest win of her career, she is a proven winner, a two-time winner of the International Women's Tour of Costa Rica, Alina Sierra. And confirmation of the win ahead of Kennedy and Spratt coming across the line together at 19 seconds behind. It was then Norman Passio, Borghini, Longo Borghini and Chapman. Then it was Rachel Nalen coming in on her own, a former winner of this race. Emily Roper, an outstanding performance. Ruth Winder in ninth. And Grace Brown, also from the Mitchelton Scott team, as per Kennedy and Spratt, rounding out the top ten. They had the strength in numbers, but it was Sierra who was just too good today. Well, she was too good uphill. She was too good tactically. And she was just too good in the corners as well. She's too good everywhere. And and gentlemen and what an afternoon of racing it has been for the Deakin University elite women's race here in Geelong. This one day classic is not an easy course with Shalumbra adding extra twists and turns at the end. These 15 women's professional cycling teams have certainly put on a show for us. It's now time to present the awards for this world class event. To present the third place for today's Deakin University Elite Women's Race, please welcome from the Office of Women and Sport and Recreation, Director Dr Bridie O'Donnell. And the winner is 
Amanda Spratt from Mitchelton Scott. Congratulations, Amanda. And congratulations to our winner, Amanda. We'll now continue with our presentations with our second place overall. And to present the second place for today's Deakin University Elite Women's Race, please welcome the member for Geelong, Christine Cousins, MP. And the winner is Lucy Kennedy again from Mitchelton Scott. Congratulations, Lucy. Ladies and gentlemen, please keep the applause coming. It is now time to present to our overall winner and to present the winner of the elite women's race. Please welcome the president of UCI Women's Commission and member of the UCI Management Committee, Tracy Galdry, and vice-chancellor of Deakin University, Professor Jane de Hollander and Australia's greatest cyclist, the winner of the 2011 Tour de France, Australia's own Cadell Evans. As part of the gifts associated with the winner today, Tag Hoyer are presenting a Tag Hoyer 300M, the ultimate sports wash inspired by the aquatic world. And the winner of today's Deakin University Elite Women's Race is Alena Sierra, all the way from Cuba, from the Astana women's team. Congratulations, Alenis. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, keep your applause coming. What an achievement. Oh, and a bit of a cheer too. Now, Cadell, I can't let you go anywhere, so can we ask you to come up to the podium very quickly? <laughs> Please welcome our Tour de France winner, Cadell Evans, again at Cadell. It is so exciting to see how this women's race is growing, isn't it? It's um, every year we've had a, a fantastic race from the women and this year was a certainly no doubt. And I have to say chapeau to Alanis. She rate absolutely fantastically and like David was saying on the commentary, she was completely invisible for 100 kilometres, waited her time and made a one solid decisive attack and here she's on top of the podium and compliments. Absolutely. And for this event, the prize money is obviously increasing. It's great to see, isn't it? Yep, and I say a big thanks to Deakin University for being supporters of the event and Channel 7 for, for televising the event because um, for the step forward for women's cycling, that's one of the most important things, I think, and oh, we're proud to be televising women's cycling live to air. Thank you very much, Cadell. I'd now like to ask for the trophy to be brought forward. It's quite an impressive trophy, too. 